Hello, and welcome to my SMS modding tutorial. Um, this should be relatively simple. I think everybody should be able to follow along, but there are a lot of steps, and it's bound to get confusing for most people, so leave any any questions in the comments section. I'll hopefully answer them. And if I can't answer the question, I will also leave a link to the Sunshine Hut, which is the uh, Sunshine Hacking Discord. Um, and there's a little help section in there. You just gotta ask to be a member, and then one of the moderators will make you a member after a short bit of time. And then, uh, you can ask a question and hang out and chat with us. Us and all the rest of the Sunshine Hackers. So, uh, yeah. Without further ado, let's get started. First, you want to open up 7-Zip, or you want to install 7-Zip so that you can get Dolphin. So what Dolphin is, Dolphin is an emulator for the GameCube and Wii that lets you play GameCube and Wii games on your computer, which makes testing way easier. If you decide to test on console only, that's cool too, but you're just wasting your, your time. I'm just going to tell you that much. So we want to install both. We want to install a development build of Dolphin 5.0, aka something 5.0-something, something, 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 something. You want a, that build. And then you want a plain old Dolphin 4.0 build. You want to have both of these installed, so um, you, I left the link in the description for that. Just hit I agree, next. Then let's just create a new folder. For Dolphin 4.0. So we should have Dolphin 4.0, perfect. Alright. Okay, cool. So now we got that set up, we got Dolphin, so I'll just open it and give you a brief rundown of Dolphin. So, you can open your games by hitting the open button and then finding where your games are stored on your computer. I store all my games here. Um, we can just boot up Mario Sunshine. Plain old Mario Sunshine can never go wrong with that. All right, and so your your game of Mario Sunshine should show up in the window or something. Uh, so yeah, this is how you can play games on your computer for GameCube, and I'm sure you're familiar with this if you want to hack Mario Sunshine. But this over here tells you what device you'll have for your controller. You can set up the buttons um, to be buttons. So you can go here, let's say, for example, the X button. I can set, I can click the B button on my controller to set the X button for that thing. And now I have both things set the B button. So yeah, that's how you play the GameCube games on your computer. Um, so next thing we want to do is get this SMS scene reader and we want to extract it. So we will uh, open it in our w Windows thing. And now we have a bunch of junk in here. So what we want to do right now is just new folder, and we'll title this bin editor. Now we got tutorial bin editor. We'll just copy all this stuff, paste it right on in. And that'll take its sweet time. Um, so here's the bin editor. So let's go into the next file I have up here, Super Mario Sunshine Project Manager. And as always, links in the description. We want to open the archive, the archive, whatever you want to call it. And now let's just make a folder for it. Oh wait, it's already in a folder, so why don't I just... Nicely do it like that, wha-bam. Alright, so while that's going, we just gotta wait. All right, our tutorial manager has finished uh, extracting, so we can close out of our extractor. All right, so what we have right now is the this is the level editor that like edits the stuff in the levels, and uh, this is the thing that helps you manage all the files that you do for editing the levels. So they work hand in hand, work pretty well in tandem. Um, so what I would do is I would put this right inside of this guy. I just put it right inside of there. So now you got them all in one place, which is very helpful. So let's just create a couple shortcuts for them, too, real quick. Okay. So now that we've got both of these things installed, 
uh, let's open up the SMS manager because we're just going to get some settings set up first before we even use it. There's the settings menu. You go to edit, then you find settings. So what you have here is the bin editor, and this is where you want to link your bin editor exe. So let's go to browse, and we put that bin editor inside of the folder from earlier over here, tutorial manager. There it is, tutorial manager. Okay, so then inside tutorial manager, we have the tutorial bin editor, which I moved here earlier. And there it is, uh, smsscenereader.exe, so open. So now when we go to edit a stage, it knows where our editing software is. Now, we want to link our game that runs it, our tool that runs the game. That's for testing, so let's go to Dolphin. And there's a reason I got you to install 5.0 and 4.0. The reason being is that this tool only works with Dolphin 4.0. Um, and 5.0 is a better tool because it's obviously the sequel. So it's just more accurate, it's better. So there's some bugs that show up on Dolphin 5.0 that won't show up on Dolphin 4.0. So once you're done a stage, I recommend testing it in Dolphin 5.0 or testing it on console just to make sure there's no bugs um, because Dolphin 4.0 is less accurate, but it is the only one that works really well with this program. So uh, some people have reported, like uh, Hallister, he, he can say hi in the comments if he's watching this, but uh, Hallister... Um, apparently he told me he got Dolphin 5.0 working with it, but I just can't get it to work. So, yeah. There's a couple things where supposedly it just works with some people's computers, and then some people just, it doesn't. So I'm going to go over the way that, in the case that it doesn't. Um, so we have, uh, to get our, link our Dolphin emulator. So let's go back to desktop. Should be a folder named Dolphin 4.0 and then dolphin.exe. Perfect, so now it knows what thing we're gonna use to play the games. So we can check mark this box. I, it's never done anything for me because this program's kinda buggy, but in theory, it should just auto load the last opened project. Uh, and open deep dolphin in debug mode, we leave that unchecked. That's probably more for the coding stuff. I don't really know what it does, but I do not click that. Um, so once you've done that, hit okay, and we can just close out of the sky for now. So next thing we have in the list is GCR. So what GCR does, GCR will take our ISO of Mario Sunshine, or our like disk image file, and it'll break it down into the smaller parts that make up the game. Um, once we have it broken down into the smaller parts, we can edit the smaller parts with our own custom stages and all that stuff, then repackage the game back into an ISO and play it, um, in theory. But we're going to use SMS Manager to make a little shortcut so we don't have to repackage it every time we need to test a level, which is great. Um, so let's go root open. Actually, we don't want to do root. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Uh, we got to go image open. And so now it's going to tell us to find our uh, Sunshine I ISO. So I have my Mario Sunshine ISO saved right here, so I'll open that. And there's a couple things you can do here. Um, you can change the names of stuff. I can name it Poopy Butt Fart Head. And I can literally save whatever the frick I want in here. Um, but yeah, you can change the titles. And in theory, you can change the banner. But I, last time I checked, the banner changing thing was a bit buggy. Um, so we can just ignore that. But what we want to do here right now is we can extract the entire game. So export. And so now we're going to get a root folder of our Mario Sunshine. So let's go with name this folder Mario Sunshine and find it in the list. Mario Sunshine. Okay. So now what it's doing is it's extracting the entire game and putting the entire game of Mario Sunshine in a giant list. Um, it has a list of folders. And now here's the data. This stores the data for a bunch of cutscenes, and then inside the scene folder, that's the data for all the levels. So Mario cutscenes and other random junk in here, levels all on here. Then audio resources has the audio stuff, and at system data, essentially has all the stuff required to boot the game on a GameCube. Um, the start.dol is like the exe of Dolphin emulator. Um, <laughs> so that's just the best way to explain the start.doll. Um, you'll become familiar with them if you ever do code injections, but 
but yeah, so that's step one with GCR. We can pretty much ignore him for a while, actually. Um, so you can close out of it. So now we got this, and inside we have our root folder. This is the important folder that we need to, because everything goes back together to this tutorial manager. So let's go back, open a tutorial manager. So you'll see in the tutorial manager I sent you, there should be this folder named root. So we want to just, you know, fix that up, move our root into this folder. You want it to look so that it has root, and it has all the stuff from the game we were just talking about. All right, nice and easy. So we can delete this now that it's empty. All right, perfect. So now we have an extracted copy of Mario Sunshine sitting in the root that's ready for us to use. So let's finally get this project manager up and running. So what we want to do is we hit File, New Project. And we can name this whatever the heck we want to name our mod. We can name it whatever. It doesn't really affect anything. It's just what you get to see when you boot up the program. So I'm just going to name this Tutorial Sunshine. All right. And now it says a default root folder was detected. Would you like to copy this folder? It may take a couple minutes. Yes. And then it says extract my ISO. Don't click that. You can just hit next. And then it'll say that it's ready and it'll be generated. And now it's processing all the folders. And this will take quite some time. Uh, so just sit back uh, and uh, wait it out. So I'll see you in a second. All right, so once it's done all of that, we will just hit OK. And now what this has done, this has generated the edit files for our project. So we go over to Projects. We go to our Tutorial Sunshine project we made earlier. That just generated all of this, the edit. So what happens when we're editing a stage, I will show later. But to explain it really quickly right now, when we make an edit to a stage, it'll save it, the edits, in the edit folder. And then when we hit the F6 key on our computer while having this window active, that will export every single stage in the list or whatever stage we decide to tell it. Um, and that will, it, that will compress it into an ARC file and then it will send it to the root folder. And so what we're doing when we test the game using Project Manager is we're really just running this start.doll, which I mentioned was like the exe of the GameCube. Um, so that's the technical breakdown of what the heck's actually happening. Um, so you're never actually playing the stages in the edit folder, but you're always editing the stages in the edit folder, then sending it into the root folder to play. Um, so um, with that out of the way, although I should explain the tabs over here. Um, the tabs over here let you view different things. Root just lets you view literally everything because we had our data and I can just see it in this format. It's pretty useless. Um, edit, um, that just shows you the edit folder I was talking about and this is lets you view all the stuff in your edit folders. But the thing that I primarily use when I'm viewing all this stuff is the scene folder because that's the only thing that really matters when it comes to stage making, which is what I'm making a tutorial for here right now. Um, so let's go to Bianco O. We can edit and edit the scene.bin, and if all goes correctly, this window should po pop up for you. Now you can go to settings in the bin editor. So this is the, uh, actually, I'm doing a terrible job at explaining this. Why don't I do this again? But this list has a list of 60, like, area codes. You can think of it as. So area code one, airport, that's the first level you ever get to in the game. The next one is... Uh, Dolpic, which is the plaza. Next one is Bianco Hills. Next is Rico Harbor. Pretty self-explanatory until you get like halfway down the list and then it becomes all this nonsense with EXs and blah blah blahs It gets confusing. But over time, you do get used to it and figure out which one's where. Um, but each number is their corresponding warp ID, which we will get into way later. Um... And I'll bring it up again when the time comes. Um, but we're just going to use this tool. So you know how we linked it earlier in the settings? Uh, we linked this tool earlier in the settings. So what this tool does is this opens up our levels. Um, yep. And this is the bin editor without a level open. So that's the bin editor. So this thing lets us open it with a level automatically by just right-clicking a level. 
and then we hit edit scene.vin and that will bring us up into the level so there's some settings we want to enable um, start preview on scene load I recommend having that enabled that's pretty much the big thing you want to do you can ignore all of this at the bottom it only messes things up um, hit apply and then you can hit cancel um, so tools and then control all P or preview that will let you actually see what's going on in the stage editor which is the really exciting part so let's get that on screen over here okay so what you can see if I zoom is it not mapped to spacebar I forgot I, it's not mapped to spacebar okay well what you can see here is we have the uh, Mario Sunshine level editing tool up here this lets us move around objects like this pineapple and to move around an object, you just uh, right you right click it or no not right left click it, and that'll give it a red box. And then you can select one of the like faces of the box, and that should be able to drag it along an axis pretty constrained. And if I grab it by the top, usually that drags it around by the top of the box, makes it easier. But every once in a while, if you grab it from like a weird angle, sometimes it doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, but you can send it way out into the distance like that. Every once in a while, you just got to get used to it. it. It works very well for what it does. And yeah, it, it's pretty good, all things considered. And uh, shout outs to Yoshi2 for being like the developer of this for the most part. I like to give him some flack because there's certain features that are still kind of buggy. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty well established, well realized level editor for Sunshine. And there's a lot of stuff I'm going to have to show you about this uh, later on down the line. But for testing purposes, uh, let's actually not go to this stage to show the power of stage editing because that'll take a while. I'll have to collect a couple shines. Let's edit this guy's scene, the airport. Because the first airport is the first level you ever get to. So it'll be much easier to show that you've actually got the game up and ready to mod. So... What we want to do is find something easy. We'll just move this tree way up in the air. I'm sure everybody finds that totally normal because plants do indeed grow in air. All right, we can hit File, Save, and now we can exit out of here. And there's this button, Export All or F6. What you want to do is hit that button. Now, if your computer works this thing correctly, then it should, in theory, you don't need to do this. If your computer works this program correctly, you should just be able to hit export. Or is it compress? I forget. I think it's compress. But in theory, those buttons would work. They don't work for me. Try seeing if they work for you. Uh, they've never worked for me. So I always hit just F6. Export all the stages. And that'll let us, let us easily test it after like a matter of seconds. Like you see, bam. All the, all the stages in the game were recompressed. And now we can hit the test button. So to test it, you can go to test and then hit test, which is control plus F5 or export and test, which is F5, compress and test, alt plus F5. But I like pressing control to F5 because my computer doesn't work with half of the things in this program, but control F5. And what is that? A floating tree. So this is a, something I would highly, highly, highly recommend doing. So let's say you make a mistake in one of your levels. Let's say you're looking for a file from the airstrip. Um, let's say you want that tree from the airstrip in the right position or something. I don't know. Um, we'll go to airstrip again. Let's say you made a custom level that replaced the airstrip. And you want to get the regular airstrip files back so that you can get the tree from the airstrip and you can copy it and paste it into your own level. Um... So let's say you want this tree in your own custom level once you've replaced the model and everything, and you make a mistake and you want to back up to the original Sunshine. So that's why it's always great to have a copy of regular plain old Sunshine also saved. So we can just copy and then paste our tutorial Sunshine folder in the projects folder, which has all this. And we can just create a copy of like regular plain old vanilla Sunshine before we mess anything up. And that way, if you ever need to grab a file from Mario Sunshine that you accidentally deleted in your mod, you can always go back here to grab a copy of it real quick by opening up it in the uh, project manager. 
I, so I just highly recommend this, not necessary, but if you got the disc space for it, I highly, highly, highly recommend. We'll just have this going in the background while I explain more stuff. Um, so this thing right here is the project info.dat folder. This is related to the manager. This isn't part of the game at all. Um, this has a list of all the files that we compressed when we hit the F6 button. Um, so here's all the files, blah de blah de blah de blah blah. So what I'm going to explain is if your computer has problems like mine does and the regular old uh, open project tutorial sunshine, do, 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 let's see here. If your computer doesn't let you just export by hitting these buttons, here's the strategy for uh, just exporting like single stages that you're repeatedly exporting over and over again. So let's say I didn't want to hit F6 and have to wait for all the stages to export. Let's say I didn't have want to wait for all the stages to export like you saw the big list last time. Um, what I can do is I can find the name of the stage in this list and then I can delete it and that'll force the game to always export it um, when we give it write only, um, read only. So let's find a level that we want the game to always permanently uh, up update pretty much. All right, um, let's go with Mama O. So Mama O is Gelato Beach Mission 1, and you'll get used to the naming conventions soon enough, but Mama O is Gelato Beach Mission 1. So we can go find, and in the find tool, I can go Mama O, and that should match us up with the first instance of the word Mama, followed by an O, and then we can just scroll down, scroll down, oh, we passed it. Mama O. We can delete that and then delete again so it's all nice and easy. So we hit File, Save. And now that we hit, actually, I should probably close out of that for safety. File, Save. Cool. And now what we want to do is we want to go to Properties on the pro Project Info Data file. And we hit Read Only. That way the game will never overwrite what we deleted and refill it back in. Then you hit apply, okay. So now, whenever we go to the SMS project manager and open up our our uh, our mod, if I hit F6 to export all, it will just export Mama O and then it will crash on us. But that saves you a lot of time if your computer just decides that it doesn't want to use the features correctly because wh whoever programmed this tool kind of messed up um, and it just doesn't work sometimes. So, anyways, that's the project info data file. Um, it is a blessing and a curse. Um, hopefully it's a blessing for you. Hopefully your computer has it working perfectly without bugs, but mine doesn't. So that's just the way to, that's just the way to like negate the, the curse if your computer doesn't actually do it right. But that's how you can export specific files without exporting other files, which saves time on exports so you don't have to wait for all the stages to export before you do what you wanted to do. But I'll just leave that empty for now. All right, so we have done quite a bit. So let's say you want to test your game with that tree in the sky, but you want to test it on Dolphin 5.0 instead of the Dolphin 4.0, which we have been using or you want to test this on your console. Um, so in order to test it on pretty much anything that isn't the editor right here, you have to compress the game back to an ISO. So that's where our GCR buddy comes in handy again. Um, we have this option now, because earlier we did root to open up the disk and get our root folder. Now we want to go to root, and we can open up our root folder for the mod from earlier. So let's go to desktop, Tutorial Manager, and now we go to our projects, and then we got our Tutorial Sunshine project, and then we go to the root folder of Tutorial Sunshine, you go to root, and then you hit OK. And that should bring up our edited version of Mario Sunshine. So now we can go root, save, and now let's name it whatever we want. We will call it Floating Tree Sunshine. Perfect, Floating Tree Sunshine. And now you just hit rebuild. And that will rebuild the entire game and put it all the way back into an ISO 
in a format that you can share with others easily without them needing to know how to hack Mario Sunshine. All right, so the game is done recompressing back to ISO. So we can close out of that now, and it should be stored wherever we stored the file. So we can go into Dolphin 5.0, let's go open, Floating Tree Sunshine. <laughs> what? Yep, there it is. Floating Tree. Floating Tree Sunshine is a mission success. So yeah. Uh, ignore. There we go. So we got it all tested back in Dolphin 5.0. All right, next thing on the list is J3D Viewer. So let's open this. And now what J3D Viewer does is it lets us view the models of objects. So we'll just call this uh, J3D. And we'll put everything in J3D in here. Nice and easy. And that'll take a moment to extract. So. We got J3D running. This is what J3D Viewer looks like. Um, but this is what it looks like when we don't have an object loaded yet. So what we can do is we can open up our project manager, open up our project, and let's find a level. Let's go with our tree from earlier in airport O. So let's go to airport O, which is the level we have with the floating tree. Let's right click it, and instead of going to edit the scene, which is like editing the objects and stuff, we're gonna go down to go to folder. And what that'll do is that will bring up the the stages folder. Um, I'll have to explain this, but every single thing in this folder is either like an enemy or an NPC right now. The only things that is not enemies or NPCs is the map and the map OBJ folders. The map folder, the map folder contains camera data. It contains the map data, the data for the actual stage itself. It contains parameters, which I kind of don't remember what they do, but that's something that's in Mario Sunshine. Um, there is the pollution data, which I'm sure you know is just the goop and stuff. There's the SP data, which is like scripts, and I will get into this, some of the basic scripting um, in a moment later in the video. Um, scripts are usually things that involve like a little thing in the bottom corner, like the red coin counter in the bottom of the corner, or the like clean off the pianta counter in the Piantas in Need mission. The scripts are generally speaking for NPC stuff and red coins and other weird oddities like that. Um, so yeah, there's some scripts for that. That's the script folder. Then we have the map collision. Then we have the message.bmg, which is the messages that the NPCs say. Um, then we have scene.bin, and that is the level with the objects we were editing earlier with the bin editor. Where you saw how I moved a tree up, that's what we were editing. We were editing this file. Then there's the scene.rail, and the scene.rail is the thing that's responsible for telling the enemies where they're going to walk to. Um, then there's tables.bin. Um, tables.bin is like scene.bin, but different. That's really all it is. It's just a different scene.bin, and it, it holds different things. Um, and then ymap.ymap. Uh, I, I don't even know what that does, but that's just a brief breakdown of everything in the map folder. So then, the map obj folder, that has objects. So this has things like the coin object, uh, juice block, let's see, that's probably watermelon block, juice block, uh, normal block, which is probably like the breakable block, and if we scroll down, probably wood block somewhere, I don't know. Shine, there's your shine sprites, there's a bunch of palm UOG, that's one of the types of trees, and then palm normal. Palm normal is the tree that we were just moving into the air a little while ago. So, since you're familiar with uh, palm normal, let's open that guy up. If it decides, oh, okay, wait, it's not even in J3D view. I'm an idiot. Um, But yeah, and then every other folder, like Mew, that is seagulls, Monty Man, that's Monty Man. Monty MC, it's something else, Monty. These are all the um, Piantas. Monty is Pianta, Peach is Peach, Sun is the Sun, uh, Fish is the Fish, uh, Fruit Boat is a Boat, Gatekeeper is the Polluted Piranha. Um, I don't remember what this guy is, but it's something. They each have names, and those are for like the enemies and the like entities. Because like Peach is like an entity or an NPC, and then like 
you know, the, the gatekeeper or the polluted prawn is like an enemy. So enemy data and like NPC data is stored just in the regular old scene folder of that level. So we're going editing airport O and then the airport O has a scene folder. And then inside the scene folder is the, all the data st stored for the level. And I just broke it down for you. Um, so we're going to open the map objects folder. So this is J3D view. Now that I've broken down where you can find all the stuff, we can go file open model. And I'm just going to paste that in there so I can get there real quick. Okay. So let's go open up a model. Let's go with a model that you'll be plenty familiar with the shine sprite. So you can see the shine sprite model directly from J3D viewer. And it also shows you the textures for it. Now these are the textures for like the, the light that's like on the it or something. I don't know. Usually there's like more textures you can edit. Um, so this is not a good example, but let's open another model. Let's go with peach. Let's see if we can open peach. Peach hand, peach model. That's probably the one we want. Oh boy, she does not look right without all the models there. But what we can do here is we can take these textures and we can extract the textures manually like this. Um, so here's Peach's eye, Peach's mouth, Peach's eye again, here's her eye closed, she has plenty of eyes, plenty of lips, and plenty of texture work. So, let's find a decent texture, like, let's go with just the regular texture, I guess, because that's, that's pretty good. Alright, so let's hit export. And so now we can export this texture onto our computer. And let's find a place we can save it. Let's save it to desktop. We'll call it Peach. Now, instead of it exporting as a PNG, it exports as the GameCube's type of PNG. The type of PNG that the GameCube can actually load. It's a .BTI. Uh, I don't remember what BTI stands for, but it probably stands for something. But that's like the GameCube's version of PNG. So we're just going to name it Peach and save it to the desktop. Perfect, here it is. We've got peach.bti. And we're just going to minimize this for now because we're going to do some little experimenting. Um, we can close out of this, I guess. So, we got J3D Viewer. Um, where did I put the... GameCube file tools should definitely be the next thing I explain if I'm explaining J3D Viewer. Um, so let's go ahead and open... And that will open up this. So, all we're caring about right now is the BTI, and that's all I really use this program for anyways, is BTI, but it does a lot of other things. Um, Yazo compression, doll executables, it does everything. It's great. Um, but right now, we only need it for the BTI. So, we can import a BTI. So, let's go to our peach.bti. Perfect. Now, we can have Peach's texture. And now, this tells us the details about how the texture is formatted. Tells us the format is CMPR, clamp to edge, clamp to edge, linear, blah, 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 blah. Those can be important because sometimes the game doesn't load the texture visually correct on console if you don't have the textures um, matching the same properties when you make a custom texture. So let's go ahead and export this BTI. Actually, no, wait, I already did that. Um, so we imported the BTI. We want to export as an image. So now I can export this picture, this texture, as a regular PNG. So we'll name that peach.png. And peach.png is here, ready to go. Peach.png. So let's just open up a nice, good old editing software, nice and easily on YouTube. Or not YouTube. I, I was just saying YouTube because I had YouTube open. My goodness. All right. So that's a nice little easy photo editing software just for tutorial purposes. You can use whatever photo editing software you want, but this is the one I'm just going to use real quick. Um, hue saturation. Let's change the color peach. Let's make her blue. That's a little too blue. Maybe let's make her redhead. We'll make peach a redhead. All right. Okay. Now we will file, export, PNG, save, yes, peach.png, show in folder. All right, close out of this, leave, and replace it because we don't need that old one anymore. 
So I like to make sure that the data is all still correct. That way there's no errors. So we're just going to keep this up at the side for reference. All right, so now we're going to import image. And we're going to choose our redhead peach wherever we saved it. There, there it is. So now we just want to match up the settings over here for the settings over here. CMPR. Let's go to CMPR. Clamp to edge, clamp to edge, nearest linear, linear, zero CC. Perfect. So now it's all matched. So we can export SBTI and we'll name this um, peach 2.BTI that we don't replace the original. Successfully saved. So now we can go back to J3D Viewer from earlier. And what we can do is we can replace this texture with our one we created. So let's go to peach2.bti and there was another one that's identical so you want to replace all of them. Mouth, peach, replace. Alright, that seems to be all of them. So we'll hit file save model and so that will save our model of peach in the folder. So <laughs> Uh oh, well that did not show up as expected, but it still showed up uh, in, in an interesting way. So you can tell, we just edited the textures of Princess Peach. And that is the main function of uh, J3D Viewer. So this is my OC, please do not steal. Uh, dark Gold Peach. Alright, we ready? It's, it's a Purple Gold Peach. There we go. Emo Peach. Yeah. Alright. So yeah, you can do interesting stuff just by t texture replacing. And you can do texture replacing with J3D even on like the map itself. So you, as you can see, you can load like literally any model you want in here. You can load an NPC model, an objects model, even a stages model. And then you can go to the stages textures and you can replace whatever texture you want. Any of them. All of them. Whatever one you want. The world is your oyster with Mario Sunshine hacking. Um... So anyways, that is J3D Viewer and GameCube File Tools. GameCube File Tools just lets you generate BTIs for stuff. And BTIs are very important because BTIs are the things that everything's texture-wise, visual-wise, visual is made up of pretty much. Um, with few exceptions. Like, for instance, I can uh, load up my regular mod that I'm working on right now. Good example, I the image you see for the title screen is actually just a BTI. So I just replaced the BTI with our Super Mario Eclipse BTI for our Super Mario Eclipse mod. Yeah, you can replace the BTI for the like title with your own custom BTI and make your own custom logo and it's really nice looking. So you can do a lot of cool stuff, a lot of, lot of cool stuff. So Sunscript Compiler is probably the most confusing part of this whole tutorial series I'm gonna be doing right here. Um, I honestly just learned this like a week ago on how to do this thanks to Hallie Stir. Um, the real champ, Hallie Stir, teaching me how to do stuff so I can teach you. Um, but let's go ahead and open that archive. So this is just a set of tools that will compile um, whatever the frick you code into like the Sanskrit language, which is the language that the NPCs work off of in Mario Sunshine. Um, so I'm sure you guys, if you've played regular Sunshine, are very familiar with the fruit lady baskets. How you give the lady three fruits, and she gives you a blue coin in exchange for the three fruits. That is done using, uh, Sunscript. And Sunscript is not, like, actual coding, it's Nintendo's little NPC coding that is used just for NPC logic. Um, but I honestly have no clue how, like, any of it works, except for... The very bare bones basics. So let's open up this template script I gave you in the downloads. Links in the description. Now these, uh, this is one that I'm using for a stage currently that I'm working on, but it's good for any purpose, testing, everything. So what we have here is um, just talking scripts for NPCs. So this tells the game what NPC talks and whatnot. So there's the NPC name sailor so there's the sailor npc um he'd be a pirate or something and then there's this number value down here so these are actually just numbers in hex like this is eight this is five six 
7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, there's some numbers missing because of just what I was using this file for. Um, but for every new NPC you want to add, you want to give them a new name, but just don't give it any space, space bars because that should mess it up, I think. But just give your next, give whatever you want to be your dialogue uh, a name, and you give it a number value in hex. And then once you do that, you hit file, save, and then we will exit out of this. And we will use Sunscript Compiler to take our .sun, which is just like a .txt file but with the .sun at the end. Um, we will take the Sunscript Compiler and we will use that to compile the .sun into an SB script that I showed you earlier. Um, so let's go npc template.sun. And this is just for basic NPC dialogue. There's more complex stuff you can do, and I believe Augs has a tutorial, Augs SMS Hacking. Uh, has a tutorial for the more complex stuff of this, but this is just the bare bones to get you by making dialogue for NPCs and stuff. So we will go to compilesun.bat and we will just drag and drop this onto compilesun.bat pc template.sb. So now we got our script from the uh, the like template script. So what we want to do is we want to put this in whatever stage we want it to work with. So let's go back to our airport one. and edit the scene for a while. Um, so we have over here airport 0, which is the stage that we've been editing. Let's go to go to folder. And now let's go to its map. And then SB, SP. Um, the SP folder is where we put our scripts, as I mentioned earlier, but you probably forgot it by now because I'm telling you so much. You can only handle so much at once, but these have all the, the scripts for things in the level, like Peach Talk, which is probably when you land in the level, Peach talking to you by default. And then Default Talk is probably related to all the NPCs that are already in the stage. So let's just put our template in here. So now it should have all of the values for our NPCs. So let's just get rid of all this stuff. Um, That could easily cause a crash, but I'm going to delete pretty much every NPC just to make sure it doesn't. So now the only NPC in the stage is this woman right here. And this woman is the one we're gonna sync up to what message we want her to say. So let's take a look back at, there's so many things open at once, geez Louise. All right, um, let's go look back at our template again. So the first thing is NPC name Sailor with a capital S and that's it. So what we want to do is the NPC Monty WB is the one that we're editing. Then there's this object key over here. So we want to match that with the name we have over in the script. So S A I L O R. Perfect. And that lets the NPC know which script, which dialogue value it's going for. And this is going for dialogue value. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, eight. It's going for dialogue value eight. All right, so let's go to tools, and then there is the BMG editor, and that lets you edit the messages, the NPC dialogue. So let's go down to eight, and this is just all the dialogue from the airstrip. So let's just edit uh, message eight real quick. Let's make it say something interesting. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, do it for the memes. All right, with an exclamation mark, apply. And the 26 down here is associated to the sound that they make when you talk to them, or the NPC's voice and everything. Um, so then that should all work out. So now that we have the actual script in there, she should say what she's meant to say. Dab, perfect. Do it for the memes. I'm gonna do it, guys. We're dabbing. Ooh, if only I had a face cam. Solid dab. As, as you can tell, I messed up the audio because the number, the dial, the NPC with dialogue number eight was probably one of the NPCs like the boat guy over there. But as you can see, that is the NPC dialogue 
basic functioning. You can add as many NPC dialogues as you want, as many NPCs, and there's fancy stuff, but I would recommend watching Og's tutorial on that because he probably knows a lot more about it than I do. I know virtually nothing aside from how to get the NPCs to work, thanks to Hallister, who helped me out on understanding how Sunstrip works. The THP is Mario's cutscenes. THP is the cutscene files, so we can open archive. So let's just open up a regular cutscene from SMS just to showcase everything. So what we have here is TH player. This will let you play THPs. Um, let's go over to our copy of Sunshine that's kind of extracted. Actually, why don't I finally rename this just to OG Sunshine? Boom. Okay. So we go to edit and then we go to Actually, no, we don't go to edit. We go to root. That's right. And then data. Perfect. So now there's a bunch of things that say TP THP here. So let's just drag and drop that onto the THP player. And as you can see, here is the end credits cutscene. Spoiler alert for Mario Sunshine. It's got a spoiler alert going on here. And uh, yeah, it shows you in its original resolution. It doesn't do anything fancy. It simply plays it for you. So you can see what your THPs look like when you make one. Just having a good time admiring it, you know. Alright, let's open up another one real quick just to show you that it means business. So there's some things that are THPs that you probably didn't know was a THP. Um... If it wants to open, it's so small. But each of the goop portals for uh, Bianco Hills, um, Rico Harbor, and, you know, Gelato Beach, their portals are all actually one video file that's just stacked over top of each other to save on space. So yeah, that's interesting too. Let's go for another one. This is having a good time. Ooh, even more spoilers. Uh-oh. Spoiler alert. I am spoiling everything. Dang, I have just picked the worst cutscenes. I, I really have. Bowser Jr. Alright. Alright. That's enough. That's enough fun. This is not fun day. This is sad, not happy day. So, we got a video that we are going to make into a custom cutscene real quick. That's what we're going to do. So I showed you the TH player. This is the THP creator. A uh, WeFlow THP video is the thing that I've used in the past to create custom videos. Um, it's a little bit weird, but we'll we'll get it working. So, And there's this really weird thing, so I should show you how it works when you do it wrong. So let me just put that on my... You don't need to see this. This is just a video editing software I use. Um, so let's go ahead and convert something to THP. Um, and show you how it's done and how you'll get an error. So this lets you choose the resolution. Always go for the nice resolution. Um, start time, these are in frames. So 300 frames is five minutes, blah, 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 blah. So you just, I don't think it matters, but. Um, see how long it is. It is nine whole seconds. And you just don't mess with volume. And then convert video. Alright, now it says it's converted. So it should look normal, but it won't be normal in-game, which is the problem. So I'll just show you it right now. I stole this meme off of the first page of YouTube. All right, so that's a good video. I think it's a very fitting video, but <laughs> so let me show you the problem with this when we load it into game. So now it should open up to the wrong cutscene. It should open up to our custom cutscene. But you notice an issue. It's a little bit slower than it's supposed to be. Um, a little bit slower than it's supposed to be. 
and th thus the audio is also wrong too. Um, that's because this thing exports cutscenes at 60 FPS while Sunshine is at 30 FPS, and there's some weird shenanigans going on. So what you want to do is you want to take your video editing software of choice. I use this random dumb free thing I found. Okay, uh, let me restart this. Okay, so what you want to do to get the cutscene to be like the correct audio and everything, and at the right speed, is you set it to 1.5 times speed. I do not know why, but just make sure that your video clip is at 1.5 times speed and it will export and play correctly in Sunshine for some reason. Perfect, look at that. All right, I'm back. So let's get back into things. Next thing we want to do, now that we've done all the complex stuff and I've taught you all that, um, we're going to get to actually modeling up a stage and uh, getting all the tools needed to import a custom model or a custom stage into the game. So uh, first things first, we want to get the textures from SMS just because they're nice uh, and you know they won't be buggy. And then I'll also show you how to make a custom texture that works. Um, so I'm just going to do sunburn because that's my mod and it's cool. And all I'm doing is dumping textures anyways. So it's not like it matters which one I do. To dump the SMS textures in a very nice and easy and quick way, just go over to advanced and settings and, uh, uh, not that settings, graphics settings. There we go. I'll go to advanced and graphics settings and then texture dumping. And then you click that, and then don't dump the mip maps. The mip maps are dumb, you don't need them. Um, but dump base textures, yes. And then get close. And then that'll start dumping all the textures. And so any texture that gets loaded will be dumped into the dump folder. All right, now we go to the Dolphin 5.0. Actually, it should be in documents, if I am thinking correctly. So for whatever reason, it saves dolphin stuff to a dolphin folder in the document. So go to dolphin emulator and then load and wait not load. Dolphin emulator then dump. There we go. And then there should be textures and then GMSE01 which is the uh, regular sunshine. It would be GMSE01 for you but I was doing sunburn so it's 03 for me. And so that should have all the textures that we just dumped. So we have all the textures that loaded in got dumped. So we got the peach mouth from earlier, Mario's eyes, all this, all that. Um, so we should just find a couple nice textures that would work well for a stage. And so now we've got these textures, but why don't I show you how to make like a legit, your own custom texture. So how to get like a legit custom texture to work in Mario Sunshine. So first let's go with some image from Google. Um, Let's go with sand, because we still need a sand texture. Let's try and find one that's a square. That's pretty square. Yeah. All right, we'll see how that works. Uh, save image S, and we'll name it sand. OK. So we have sand.jpg. What you want to do is make sure that the PNG is a multiple of 16. So that could be 32 by 32, 64 by 64, 128 by 128. Or you could even do 64 by 128, which is basically what's done here, where there's like 64 across and there's like probably like three times 128 down. But, oh, I just realized I'm on the wrong screen. Um. Which is what this texture here is doing, because it has to be at least like 64 across and then a multiple of that uh, down. So if we go to resize and go by pixels, it shows you the exact amount. So it's 128 pixels long and 1024 pixels vertically. So essentially, it has to be a multiple of 16. So it could be like 16 by 16, 32 by 32, 64 by 64, 128 by 128. And the quality in the, the texture increases every... You know, yeah. So that's that's how textures are handled. They have to be multiples of two. Otherwise, they get buggy and they crash on console and stuff. 
and uh, yeah. So let's just go back over to our sand.png, and then let's go to resize. Make sure that this is, see this is not very good shape. So let's go 128, and we don't want to maintain 128 by 128. Perfect. So we hit OK to apply, and you hit save, and now that should be good for Mario Sunshine. And that's literally the only problem you'll ever have with, like, textures being weird is if they're not, like, a multiple of 16. Um, so, now we got to actually install Blender. So, we have this Blender folder up here. This is Blender. You're going to have to get used to it. It's the best free modeling software for Mario Sunshine. All right, so Blender has finished extracting. We will just rename this to, uh, so that it's a bit less convoluted of a name. So in here, we have a bunch of folders in junk. And we want to install our add-ons that allow for us to export custom uh, collision and visual models for Sunshine. So what we want to do is, first let's install the custom collision, this Blender call. So Blender call. Um, has this stuff right here. So let's go up and I'll show you. So if we open up Blender, we go from Blender to Blender 2.79, Scripts, Modules. And then that's where you want to put this stuff in here. You want to just put all three of them right in here. The README it doesn't matter, but you just, you just want to, you want to do it that way. Just put it all right in there, and then that should legit just work. <laughs> so let me show you how to install the Collision mod. So this is what you should see when you open Blender for the first time. You should have a little camera, and that's called a camera, and this is called a light source, and then this is an object. So what I want you to do is ignore everything I just told you. Delete that, delete that, and click it and delete that. Now, to in order to delete things, you'll probably naturally want to left click. Um, but for Blender, you want to uh, right click. Right click is left click and left click is right click in Blender. So you want to right click something, then you want to hit the delete key. And then it's like, are you sure you want to delete? And then you tell it, yes, I want to delete with the regular left click. Because all the menus and stuff, it's like regular mode. You left click is left click, right click is right click. But then when you're in modeling and all that stuff, you have to left click to right click. I mean, you have to right click to left click. Um, it's very backwards, it's very stupid, and you get used to it. You really do. Um, but at first, it's very cumbersome, and everything about Blender is not beginner friendly. <laughs> so, that's something. Um, so, what we are going to have to do is we're going to make it so that export has an option for .col and .bmd. Um, COL stands for collision, and BMD stands for binary model data, I think, which is the type of model format that Mario Sunshine uses. So what we want to do in order to install these add-ons is we want to go to user preferences. User preferences will bring up this menu. You can go to add-ons, and it says install add-on from file. So if you saw where I told you to put that file earlier uh, inside the Blender folder, that would be Blender 2.79 scripts and then modules. And then that's where you have Blender col.py. That's what we want to install right there. So I'm just going to copy the address in there real quick. Put that in there. Perfect. So now we have scripts, modules, and it should have our blender coal.py. So we want to click that and then we want to install add-on from file. And now it says import export collision for Super Mario Sunshine. So what you want to do is click that check mark and then it'll tell you the uh, the any like things to know. It runs update function every 0 0.2 seconds. You can just ignore it. It always says that. That's not an error on your part. That's just the way it works. Um, so that is blender coal working. Um, so now if we go to file export, we have collision. So now we can export as a collision file. The next thing we want to set up is exporting as a BMD, which is the visual model. So there's this great tool we have called super BMD dot zip. 
um, this guy, we gotta unzip him first. This little tool is gonna, we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of complex stuff with it, but we're gonna do the simple part right now. So with Blender, um, there's this little script right here, um, Blender MD. Um, dot py. This is the BMD script that will export BMD scripts the same way that we have it so that it can export collision right here. Um, so what you have to do to get this to work is there's one step you have to take. Um, there's this little spot I have right here. It's called your path, your super BMD path here. So what you want to do is you want to, my goodness, this is a long window. Jeez. All right, um, size this guy down a little bit. Okay, so what you want to do is this text right here, you want to make it the same as the path to Super BMD. So you got your Super BMD folder. You want to open Super BMD. Then you want to take this little box up here. You want to click and then copy that to your clipboard. And then you want to just paste that in here. And then you see these single backslashes. You just want to make them doubles. So just put in an extra backslash. And then you're all set. This is what you want it to look like. Except with your user, your path your path to this, just set up like that. And then what you want to do is you want to hit File, then you want to hit Save. Now you can close out of this. And this BlenderMD.py, we're putting this in the same spot that we put the Blender call thing, the Blender collision thing. So we go back to our Blender, we go 2.79, Scripts, modules and that's where we have the blender collision so now we put our blender md perfect and that will allow us to then install it and have it in here so let's go back to our add-on installing so install add-on from file and let's go back to full screen so we can actually find it in the list blender md and now import export BMD with Super BMD. And now it says, we'll overwrite a FBX file of the same name as the BMD. So that's just a warning that if you save your model as a uh, FBX, it overwrites that FBX. Because all that this script does is it uses Super BMD to export, uh, it auto exports as an FBX and then puts that FBX into Super BMD and then deletes the FBX once it's done, basically. So it does overwrite any FBX with the same name. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much all we have to do setup wise to get Blender to export BMD and COL. So now we have both BMD and COL that is going to be able to export, which is great. So this is where the cool stuff happens with this super BMD thing. So we're going to make a custom stage, but first I'm going to show you how to import models into and out of Sunshine. Because I feel like that'd be what we should want to go over first, because it's going to be much less complicated than a full-on stage. A um, little bit of a learning curve with a full stage. A little bit less of a learning curve if we make a custom object. So let's go back to our airport again. So let's go ahead and go to the folder of the airport. And we'll go to the map objects. Let's see what objects we have in here. Um that are easy enough to edit. Probably not a lot, but the wood, mm, I'm trying to see, ooh, normal block, normal block dot BMD. Okay, perfect. Copy, copy. And you'll see what the normal block is in just a minute. So a normal block should be in literally every stage in the game, if I remember. Um, so let's just create a folder for this model and we'll call it normal block that's what it is it's the normal block now inside this folder we are going to copy it and we are going to paste it pretty simple now now that we have this in a folder and all pasted we go over to our super BMD from a little bit ago and we find super BMD.exe and we drag and drop this onto super BMD.exe and we hit the run button and perfect so what this has done is this has dumped that model it has taken the normal block model it's given us the normal block models textures and it's also given us the normal block models material that json and text header 
We will get into the material.json and text header later, um, but we will not get over that right now. Um, normal block.dae. A .dae file is a model file, so that's just a type of model file. And we're going to import that into our empty thing of Blender right here. So we go File, Import, and then we can go to DAE. And now let's go find our normal block. And there's our normal block.dae right there. And we'll, as you can see, we have loaded in the normal block. But you might notice that it's lacking a whole lot of color blocking in a whole lot of everything. So I'm gonna have to teach you how to get them to load colors again. So if you're importing a object that's from the game, you do have to reassign it the, the uh, textures and stuff and the images. So first thing you wanna do is get yourself familiarized with some stuff. I'm gonna be teaching this to you, um, most of the Blender stuff, which is gonna take a while. Um, so this is gonna be the majority of the tutorial probably, is Blender. So you see this little triangle here, um, let me just bring that back in so you see this little thing of three lines up here this little triangle in the corner you can take that and you can drag it down and you can duplicate uh, the screen basically you can make two instances and now if you want to remove it you drag the bottom one corner back into it you can also split it uh, this way this is what I do I split it this way and so again to get rid of it you can take the corner of the original one and then you drag it over top of the new one and then that will remove it. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag this and we're going to have two of these things open. Now what we're going to do is going to change it from the 3D view and we're going to go down here, go from 3D view and we're going to go to UV slash image editor. Perfect. So that gives us like a 2D plane rather than our three dimensional plane in here with the object. So this is wh where we edit textures and stuff. Um, so I'll just show you the game as it has the textures loaded. So over here is the materials. This circle with the checkboard over on the side, this is the materials. And so far, this brick block only has one material, M O underscore O one. And uh, whenever you put the thing through Super BMD, it adds this like M O part. So we can just delete that and it's usually just underscore 01 is the material's name. So the material has a texture or an image assigned to it. The image file is over here in the flat checkerboard instead of the circular checkerboard. This has the texture file. And as you can see, there's this generic orange looking texture that is used for the block. So in order to get it to load when you import a model, this is specifically for when you're importing a model, um, you want to you can press A to select all, so you press A and then you hit, well this wouldn't work in all cases actually, let's just click it and then once you click the object, you hit tab, and hitting tab will bring you in and out of your last uh, mode in this little selection menu, it'll bring you out of your last mode in this little menu down here, um, which is very handy, tab will let you easily go from object mode to edit mode, object edit, object edit, object edit, you'll be using it a lot. So remember that the tab key does that, or if you can't remember the tab key, it is over in here. You can go from object mode to edit mode, object mode, edit mode. Nice and easy. Um, so what we want to do is we can press, once we're in edit mode, we can press A, and A will select everything. A for all, and then you hit A again. If you hit A two times, it deselects everything. So A, select everything. A again, deselect everything. So we are going to hit A to select everything. And that will show us the way the texture is loaded on the cube itself. So the way that like the texture is like represented in 3D space is shown in here in 2D space. Um, so let's click the normal texture. And so now it has the brick block texture behind the regular mapping. So you might be wondering why the heck is it that it still looks like it has no color to it whatsoever even though we just click the button to add this button down here in the 2D view with the, the whole UV image editor, why is it still not showing? And that's because you have viewing modes. Um, we are currently in, uh, wait, is it, no, it's not here. It's, here it is. We are currently in solid mode, which just shows you like walls and such. But if we go over to texture mode, 
that will show us the textures because this is the texture remember the square over here is texture and this is material and this is texture so if we go over to material view um, it'll show you the material but the only problem with material right now and why is it all black is because we don't have a light source so if we go to create and then light source okay and then GZ that should bring it it should give us like all right well it kind of <laughs> it's kind of small um, GZ, a little, bring it up a little bit more. All right, well, this light source isn't working out all that well, so we'll just hit delete. Anyways, but just ignore that. Just always go to texture view. That's my preferred thing. Then, um, I should tell you about the views. So there is rendered, which, like, is for, like, taking photos and stuff, so you don't really need that. There is material, which is, again, is dark, so it's not useful. Then there's textured mode, which is probably the most useful rendering mode. Then there's solid view, which just shows you the planes as they are as a regular model. And then finally, there's wireframe view, which shows you the back of the thing at the same time. It makes it all just wires. All right, so one thing you might notice uh, when modeling in Blender for Mario Sunshine, is that this is the little starting place. This is the little, like, starting platform. And every single object in Mario Sunshine is, like, 10 per billion times bigger than the Blender default starting grid. Um, I don't know an exact number, but it's somewhere, like, 200 times larger than this thing. Um... Do you see this little pointer thing? That has to do with like animations and stuff, and animations tend to actually ruin the model and make it so it doesn't export correctly. So what you gotta do to get it so that this can actually export correctly is we can go to mesh, and that's the mesh. You have this object, this is the object. Then we go down to the mesh, and mesh is just the model. So we take the mesh and let's just take it out of the skeleton root, and now that it's out of the skeleton root, we can delete the skeleton root. And no problem, now it is out of there and we don't have to worry about the animation data and all that jazz. Just a plain old nice object. So along with this being a way to that you can select the viewing mode, you can also change the viewing mode by holding, holding down Alt and Z, the Z button. So if you hold down Alt and Z, that will bring you to textured mode. If you hold down Shift and Z, that will bring you to uh, rendered mode, which is pretty useless. And then if you hit Z, that'll bring you to wireframe. And if you hit Z again, that'll bring you to solid. So like Z will transfer you from solid to wireframe. And then holding down Alt and Z will bring you to textured mode. Now, you might not use the hotkeys at first, but trust me, over time, you will learn them. But in the meantime, I will tell you how to find them down here and stuff. Um, there's going to be a lot of just like neat modeling tools that help you out in Blender. So let's... So now that we got this representation visually of what the cube is, I'm sure you've seen it in Mario Sunshine in a couple places, but it goes relatively unused. Um, relatively. So we can just hide this guy for now, and let's model up a model that we want to replace the block. So we'll just hide this. There, you can hide this object by... You can hide anything you want to hide by selecting it so that it's, like, selected. And now that it's selected... You can hit H for hide, or if you don't like H for hide, you can hit this little eyeball up in the corner, and that will hide the object too. And then if you want to unhide, you can hold Alt and H, and that will unhide it. Or you can just hit the eyeball again. So we're just going to hide this guy for now. We're going to start by adding in our own object. So that was us importing a, the basic object into Sunshine. So now I should show you how to make our own cool stuff so that we can make this regular old plain boring cube into a very interesting, unique custom cube. Uh, first thing you want to do is hold down shift and press A. I do not know the command to get this menu up, so you're just going to have to remember shift and A. Um, but you hit shift and A, and A stands for add, as you can see at the top. Then there's this mesh right here, and this allows us to start with whatever shape we want, and then we're going to work from there. So what, let's do, let's see what we can do. We can make, because this is going to be going into the airstrip. So let's make something kind of airstrip-y themed. Uh, 
let's make some weird platform we can put on the airstrip, I guess. Let's go with the, let's start with the cylinder, because that'll teach you how to do some things I want to teach you. So once you add the cylinder, there's this little thing down here. It shows you vertices and radius and depth. You really don't really need to re worry about radius and depth, just the vertices. Um, for Sunshine's sake, you don't want the poly count to be extremely high because this is just a GameCube game. Uh, it's more powerful than the N64, and that's for sure, but it's definitely not as powerful as the Wii and anything after that, you know? Um, so just keep in mind that you want it to be, like, a couple steps above N64, but, like, you don't want to go full crazy with the poly count because 32 is just a little bit of overdoing it for a freaking mountain we're going to make. So let's go from 32, and let's drop that down to, like, let's say 15. That's probably good for a starting platform. Um, so in order to zoom into your object, as you can see, the camera is kind of way out here. It just kind of sucks, and you can't really see anything. If you hit the period key on the number pad, um, you can zoom in on it. And that will, like, focus your visuals on the object. So, what... Now I can explain some basic maneuvering in Blender. Um, this is probably the most like vital thing in Blender to learn, and this is the like grab feature. So if you're holding this object, you got this object selected. So let's actually just go to object mode because it's easier to see the orange. So let's say I don't have it selected. I want to select it first, of course. Now what we can do is we can hit G. G is for grab and that will allow us to move it around the place. And notice that your mouse will actually loop around, and it'll never hit the border of your monitor. It just loops and loops and loops, so you can keep on dragging it in whatever direction you want for, like, as long as you want, which is great. Um, so once you've done figure out grab, you can hit grab, and now everything in this world, this blender world, moves along three axes. It moves along the x-axis, um, why don't I get a better view of that? Yeah. Um, it moves along the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. So this is Z is up and down, Y is, I guess, left and right, and then X is forward and back, whatever you want to say. Um, so you see how I'm moving it just along the. Oh, whoops, I hit the wrong one. You see how I'm moving it just up and down? Like, how am I doing that? In order to move it just up and down, you have to hit the grab button for grab, and then hit Z for Z axis. And then if you want to do that along the X axis, it's grab and then X for X axis. Or you can do grab and then Y for Y axis. Pretty simple. Now here's where it gets super cool. Um, you can hit G, and then you can hit G and then shift Z. And if you hit G and then Shift and then Z, that says everything but the Z axis. So now this object will move on everything but the Z axis. So if I go ahead and go G Shift Y, now it'll move on everything but the Y axis. And this is like very helpful for a lot of situations. You've got to get used to this. Um, it's it's simply a must. Um, so that is that. Um, let's see. What else? What else? What else? What else? Okay, scaling. So let's say we want to make this thing a bit bigger, even though it's already pretty pretty darn big. Let's say we want to make it bigger. What you can do is you can hit the letter S, S for scale, and then you can drag it in and out, and then I'll make it bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. Let's say you want to scale but only along one axis, like the z-axis. So we, that would just make it longer, you see? Now I can get like pancake, soda can, uh, pole, extra long pole, super extra long pole. You, you can make it whatever you want with that scale. And then you can also scale it along a different axis that's not z, so we can go scale x. And I'll make it a nice big oval until it looks stupid, but now we got a paddle to slap our children with. Ha 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 funny joke. Alright, um, anyways. And as always, control Z is undo, and then control shift Z is redo. Pretty simple. Okay. So, 
you can't really do too much with the object aside from grab and uh, scale when you're in object mode. So we're in object mode. So let's say we want to add stuff to this, this do stuff with this guy. We want to bring it over into edit mode first. Now, here's something I need to teach you next. Um, I will need to show you how to select things. Um, so, you know, you select things as makes sense. We select it with the right mouse button. So now you can select individual faces and I can move just the top part of this cylinder. I can hit G and then I can, you know, I can move it around like the other stuff. I can even move it on the Z axis. I can move it on the Y axis. I can move it on the X axis. I can do whatever the heck I want with this little guy right here. So, ooh, I didn't, okay, cool. So let's take this face right here and I'll show you how to select things. Um, so we can select all these different faces. So you see these three little boxes down here and how one's dark and the other ones are light? That's because I'm in face selection mode. And with that face selection mode, that means I can select any like face, any flat surface. Now, if I change it to this line thing, I click line, that'll allow it so I can only click lines, and I select lines. All right. So now if I go to this little dot thing, that's the vertices, and that allows me to only select each individual, like, vertice, the part where, like, two edges meet. And of course, just like the faces, you can move these guys up and down, all around, whatever, which way you want. Oh, and you can even break it and look at that. That's not, that's ugly. But anyways. And let's say you want to be in face select and vertex select at the same time. You can, then if you want to do that, you can hit the face select. Then you hold down shift and you click the other one. Now you got in two modes at once. So now I can hit the vertice and I can grab that at the same time as grabbing a face. And now I can grab both of those at the same time. Pretty helpful. All right, so I'm going to just start modeling up something. Uh, actually, I should show you how to add more textures, because right now we only have this brick texture, which is pretty boring and pretty stale. Uh, nothing much going on there. So let's add our own custom texture. So you know how we dumped the textures earlier? Well, in order to add a texture, um, actually, I have to be in uh, object mode. You have to be in object mode when you're doing texture stuff for some reason. Um, when you're adding them. So there's this, uh, I'll just restart. So over here, you can see there's this list right here that's completely empty. We can press plus and that will add the list. We have to be in the circle guy, the circle guy right here. So once we're in this list, you can hit plus and that will add a new material to the model. And now well, the model file, it's not applied to the model yet. I got to clarify that. Um, so now we got this new material, and that's nothing yet. We have to click new again because Blender's weird. You have to hit new, and then you have to hit new again. So we hit new down here, and then now that will generate a whole menu down here, and it'll also say material dot oh oh one. So we want to name this to whatever the heck we want to name it. Let's name it to wall. We'll name it wall. All right, and this will be our wall texture. Um, so you can pretty much ignore everything down here for now, for now, just hang tight. Um, then we have the image. So make sure you still have the wall selected in case you have multiple text materials already there. Make sure you selected wall. And now you go over to the square one, which was the texture instead of material, texture, material, texture. So we go over to the texture and now we want to hit new. And once we hit new, there's this button that says open. And that's what you want to do. You want to just hit open. And now this is the fun part where we get to select our photo from over here. So we just go to desktop, let's see, desktop. And let's name this something so we can actually tell what it is that we're selecting. Um, this guy, let's name this guy wall. So wall texture. All right, so now we can go in here and we have to find wall texture. Maybe I have to refresh it. I don't know. I just renamed it, so. Wall texture, there it is. All right, so now we have the picture loaded into Blender. 
So what we can do is we can go back over to the materials and now suddenly our material has the wall texture. Now this is just a preview of the material so we can put it on a square and that'll put it in a square. We can put it on a cube and that'll show what it looks like on a cube. Put it on a monkey if you want. You can put it on grass? I don't know. You can put it on this. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but cube just gives you a nice good visual representation of what the heck's going on. So I'll do that for the sake of this tutorial. Um, but it really has no significance whatsoever. It just shows you what it looks like. So now let's actually get this photo on this, this uh, cylinder right here. So let's go and head and click back into this area. And what we want to do is we want to hit the tab button and tab will bring us back into edit mode. Or you can of course, as always, go down here to get to edit mode. And we want to select any face we want to make that texture appear on. So let's collect all the faces. We can collect all the faces by hitting A. And now we have to do what is called um, texture unwrapping. So to do texture unwrapping, you just hit the U key for unwrap. I do not remember if there's like a hot... I only remember the U key. I don't remember what button it is where, like down here. It's just... It's somewhere. But you just press U to unwrap. And this will give you unwrap options. So let's just hit basic unwrap. And so that will unwrap all the faces. As you can see, we click this circle. We got the circle over here. We click this circle. We got the circle still. It's the same circle. So it looks like nothing changed, but it did. Because if I go select nothing, it's not there. I select this. There it is. There it is. Cool. So let's see these faces. So these faces are all squares like they are squares over here. Except these guys are stretched, whereas these ones are just kind of a regular square, which is very interesting. Um, so let's go over, and we should just select all the faces by hitting A and then getting everything orange. And if you don't see it orange like this, and you're in like textured mode, that could be the reason why you want to get it into solid view if you want to see the way I'm seeing things right now. So what we want to do is now that we got every single face selected, Let's go over to our texture, let's select our wall texture, and then hit assign. Or I mean our wall material, not texture. I said material I said material. I mean I said texture, but I meant to say material. Um so now that we got the wall texture and we just hit assign. Now this has the wall material. But if we go back into our texture viewer, it still has the brick texture, even though it has the wall material. So what we want to do is not only do we want to click the wall and then click assign to get the wall material, we also want to go over down into our texture viewer, which I showed you from the pulling the triangle earlier. We want you to go over to this little menu, this little picture of a picture right here, and you want to click the wall texture. Now, if we go into the rendered view, you can see that we have the wall texture. Now, this wall texture is pretty gosh darn ugly, though, the way it is right now. So now I gotta show you how to unwrap textures. Oh, as you can see, it decided to stretch it along the actual texture, which is really weird. So let's say you wanna make this, and we can just select an individual face, and we don't have to select everything and hit the U for unwrap, but we can also just select a single face and then hit U and then unwrap, and that'll unwrap just this single face. So now we got this nice little circle down here. And just like how we can hit G and then Z in the rendered view and the model editing. We can also go over here and we can hit G and we can grab it and move it around. And we can even hit S and scale it in the texture. Just like the 3D but in 2D. So what we want to do is we want this to look like it's the top of the mountain or something. So let's just bring that GZ perfect. So now it just looks like there's grass on the top of the hill. Perfect. Now, let's say you are running out of space on here for some reason, and you have it off like here, Just to, and now it still repeats, but you kind of want to see what this blackness over here is, because it's nice to be able to see it, rather than guessing where it is and having to make slight adjustments every 12 seconds. There's this little button on your keyboard. Hit N. If you hit the N key, that will bring up this context menu. Hitting N will bring up this menu, and then if you go down, there's this little button that says repeat. You just want to click that, then you can hit N again. If you hit N again, that'll hide it. And 
there you go. Now it repeats into infinity until the, the computer can no longer process that many looping versions of the texture, which is very impressive. Um, it can lag out when you do zoom out because it's just your computer trying to process it all, <laughs> which is hecka impressive, I gotta say. But it doesn't lag out as long as you're not zoomed out like that. Um, so right now we just have this little circle right here. So let's see what happens. Let's just select all the walls. Let's see. Go back into this view so that you can see what I'm doing a little bit better. But here's another thing for selecting. So let's say you wanted to select this face and this face at the same time. You would want to select this face, then hold down the shift key, and then select this face. Boom. Because if you hold down shift, you can keep on adding things to the selection. And then if you're holding down shift, you can click it again to remove it from the selection. So let's say, here's this really cool thing. So if you click something, and then you, instead of holding down shift, you hold down control. If you hold down control, it'll make the shortest path to the next thing you click. So let's say I click here, and then I click over to this face, like two faces over, like one, two, and then this one. So if I hold down control, it'll find the shortest path to the next face, and it'll select all the things in that path. So let's say I was going from this face, all the way to this face. So I went and hit control. Okay, well, I guess it didn't do it there. That's kind of weird. All right, well, you know, that's not worth explaining. Um, anyways, so I'm just gonna select all the faces that are walls. And now I'm gonna hit U for unwrap. And we're gonna go into view mode. Now let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see what's going on, because it's all messed up. But you'll want to understand why it's messed up. So you see, you'd expect it to just show up like, you know, a wall, but instead it's a giant circle of a texture, which is really weird. So the reason it does this is um, because we didn't give it a seam. So imagine this cylinder we have right here. Imagine you're trying to make like origami and you have to cut a piece of paper in order to make this cylinder. So that's what marking a seam is. Marking a seam is like, taking a piece of paper and making a rip right down the middle um so that it's not connected anymore like in the logic it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense i'm trying my best but um it maybe it makes more sense you can probably find some other youtube tutorials that use the whole origami video better than i do the origami metaphor better in blender than i do but what you what you want to do to get this texture to actually un unwrap correctly is you want to hit E, the E key, and if you hit, oh, whoops, not not E, not just E, it's Control and E. And if you go Control E, it'll say Mark Edge slash Face. There's also Edge Data. You want to go down to Edge Data, and you want to go to Mark Seam, and that will give that specific line a little redness to it. It'll have a red line. So let's go back to Face Selection Mode, and let's just... Select all the faces real quick. And now let's hit U for unwrap. And it still does it stupidly. That's because it sees these two faces up here. So let's just hide them real quick. And then we'll hit U for unwrap again. Perfect. So now it's all one nice big long set of squares. Um, because it sees like because there was like a seam in there, like imagine that you're taking this thing, th imagine this circle is a piece of paper that we curled up. And when I hit U to unwrap without the seam, it just thought of it to unwrap it as a circle because it's a circle. But when I gave it the seam, I let the, the blender know that this is actually like a flat piece of paper that I curled instead of it just being a circle. I don't know if that made any sense whatsoever, but marking seams will sometimes allow you to texture things a bit better but most of the time, it's just Blender, and it's buggy, and it's weird. Um, so we'll move this. Oh, yeah, and you can also move along just the Y-axis or just the X-axis, like in normal Blender. So let's hit S to scale this up, and then we can go G, Y to bring it up a little bit. Perfect. So now you can see that there's, like, the ground, and there's the, the, the uh, wall. But let's make that look a little bit nor more normal so let's go gy 
just the right amount of grass up at the top there. Perfect. So that's that's respectable. That's a respectable amount of grass. Uh, yeah. And so we just unhid the ceilings there, but you can unwrap things. So there's another way you can unwrap things that uh is a little bit less professional, but I still like it. So I'm just gonna shift and D for duplicate, and then shift and Z so that I move it not along the x-axis. So I can just duplicate this for, for uh, demonstration purposes. Um, but there's this other method of unwrapping that's pretty handy. So let's go to U for unwrap, and then project from view. And what you'll notice from project from view is that it literally took the way I was viewing it and then put it directly into the 2D edit mode. So now you can see the texture is repeating itself like natural for the most part. Um, but if I suddenly were to change my perspective, it would all kind of fall apart. <laughs> but from this one perspective, it looks completely normal. Um, so that's the easy way, the lazy man's way of model texture mapping some stuff. So let's say I just these three faces were buggy. We could go U and then project from view, and I could go scale, and well, bam, it's in there. Now it's not in there nice. It's all messed up like this. It's all kind of curved and bulgy. So there is a way to fix this. Um, there's also this. So I should also teach you this way to select things. So you know how I was telling you, Control will let you make a path to whatever you were just last selecting. Well, there's another way you can select things too, and this is achieved by hitting the letter C. By hitting C, you'll get this little circle thing, and then whenever you left click, you will add stuff to your your selection, anything that's like in view. And then by hitting the C button and then hold clicking in the middle mouse wheel, if you click in your mouse wheel, you can deselect things from C. Very weird controls, but you do get used to it over time. So you can hit C to select things in like bulk like that. And then if you go into wireframe mode, like let's say we hit C and we select all these faces, but then we turn around and we realize we didn't get anything from the back side. Well, that's because C select only works for things on the front side. So let's say we want to use C select to get things that were on the back side. We could hit the uh, wireframe button or the wireframe uh, should be down here, so we're in wireframe, and then that will let us get the things on the back side of the model as well. Oh, look at that, I messed this up already, that's cool. Um, so we can just hit C, and then that will get everything. It won't just get the front side, it'll also get the back side, because you can see through it. Okay. Uh, what was I thinking about when I, before I said the C select? Ah, oh, boy. I forget where my train of thought was going. So we're just going to delete this real quick. Do you, if you just hit the delete button on your keyboard, you can delete things, and it'll tell you, do you want to delete the vertices, edges, or faces? I just do faces most of the time. There we go. Now we got a fresh cylinder. Just Okay, what was I doing before this? I was going to explain. I guess I'll just move on to whatever the heck else I need to explain. But think real quick oh yeah that's what I was gonna explain so you just select all these again so let's say a couple let's say you unwrap it from project from view so that's like you project from view and then we can just scale these guys up so they make more sense but you see it's all curved when I projected from view so it's all kind of messed up well there's a way we can fix this so we go ahead and we hit our C button, and we can do our C select like how we did C select over here. We can C select even in 2D view. So we can just select all the top guys, because they're all a little bit out of whack. They're all kind of at different heights. 
So to make them all at the same height, we can just hit S for scale, Y for height, and then for height we can make it zero, and then that will always make it a flat sh straight surface. So I'll just do that again for the bottom. We hit C for our C select. Then we can drag that over the points to select them. Then we hit S for scale, Y for vertical, and then zero for zero. And then that makes it flat. And then of course you can scale them in and out to try and match it to make them vertically aligned too. Or you can do the same exact thing, but along the X axis too. So you can go scale X zero, bada bing bada boom and get that perfectly straight. So that's like a way to get them a bit more straight than if you do the project from view. And here's there's a reason why we don't just go individually and go you unwrap and then you unwrap and then you unwrap is because these guys aren't going to end up being connected. So instead of all being laid out side by side by side by side by side by side and having the texture loop seamlessly, if we just did project from view like regularly without selecting a bunch of other things, um, it could send out. It could be. It could end up. Uh, could go into tab. It could end up choppy. Like you see the lines now. You can see where the the faces start and where they end. You can see that like invisible line. And for in generally, you don't want that to happen. But if you do, it's not like the end of the world or anything. It's just ugly. All right. So that's like my basic rundown on texture work. Oh, I just hit undo one too many times too quickly. Well, sometimes Blender crashes if you undo too quickly, so cool. All right, so that, that basically gets us back to where we were at. Um, so another cool handy feature I should teach you is, um, actually a lot of the things I'm gonna have to teach you are gonna be in this menu over here, so I might as well show you it. For those of you who can't remember a whole bunch of hotkeys all at once, which was me when I started learning Blender, um, all of the things I'm going to do for, like, you know, making objects move and such, they should also all be over here in this menu. Um, like, extrude is in here, inset faces, mark edges slash face, all the fun stuff. So, let's make this island a little bit unique, you know? I'm thinking we could make it work a little bit better. So let's, let me show you how to inset faces. Inset faces is right here, if you don't know the shortcut. But inset faces is I, so you can just hit the I key for inset. And then that will do this sort of thing, you know? Um, so now we got to inset, the we, now the faces are inset. So what we can do is we can hit G and then Z, and that will grab it vertically along the Z axis. And so now our hill is a little bit more rounded. Now, there's many ways you can do that, but that's just one easy way to do it. So let me show you another way you can do it that's not even using inset. Let's say you want to use, I think it's Control-R, yes. Okay, so if you hit Control and the R key, you get a loop, cut, and slide. And loop, cut, and slide will generate, like, a new circle around. It'll basically, imagine a piece of string and clay, if you've worked with, like, clay things before. Let's say you have like a block of clay and a piece of string and you pull that piece of string through the clay block, it'll make a nice slice right through the, the object. That's basically what loop, cut, and slide does. Um, so what we can do is we can hit Control R, that's the shortcut for loop, cut, and slide, really random, honestly. Now, once we're in this menu, we can actually increase the amount of cuts, but we should only need like one. So we'll just do one right now. And you can click with the left mouse to select it and now you can select the height you want it at. So we'll just select it up here real high, and that'll make us a new loop. As you can see though, it has messed with our textures, so we'll have to redo the unwrapping. That's why in general, you wanna model first, then texture la later, because if you model it first, and then if you texture it first and then model it later, sometimes doing stuff like loop, cut, and slide will mess with the textures badly like this. Um, so that's another way to do it. So let's say there's a third way you want to make that nice rounded. Actually, I didn't even finish showing you how that was a way to do it. All right, well, you know what? Hold up. But then once we have that, we can just click the top one. And once we have the top one, we can 
hit S to scale it down a little bit. And then we can have these be the like rounded edges at the of the hill. You know? Uh anyways, that's one way you could make the hill a little bit more rounded. And this doesn't just have to be for rounding hills. These are just in general tools you'll end up using. Um so let's see here. Oh yeah, then there's bevel, which I believe is control B. Control B is bevel, and that will instantly do that all whole process for you. It'll instantly bevel it. Now if you scroll wheel up while beveling, it'll give you more faces in the bevel. So you can make it more rounded. Although the more and more you bevel, the more and more the GameCube has to handle, and the less and less practical it actually becomes. So you want to do maybe one, two, maybe three bevels at most, you know? Otherwise you're going to, oh, it's just overkill, at least for the GameCube. I personally would do like two bevels. That's probably just about right. And bevel did just give us a really nice result, so I think I'll stick with that once we get the shape down. So one way I like to make little like hills for sunshine is I like to grab go into edge selection i'll just put it in solid view so you can tell what i'm doing a little bit better but then i like to grab an edge and then i like to hit g shift z and then i can move this edge wherever i want to to make it a little bit more natural so it's not like a completely spherical hill make it look more natural rather than just man-made circle hill Although Mario is definitely familiar with man-made looking hills. There's plenty of square hills in Mario, that's for sure. Okay. All right, let's call that a day. That's looking a bit more decent. So now you'll notice that once we've uh, messed with the walls, that the texture for the grass is kind of getting all stretched because it's still a circle, but it's all messed up over here. So something I should be able to show you real quick is if you hold down Control and press T, that will triangulate it. And what triangulating does is it shows you what the face is really made out of. Because right now, it's hiding the fact that it's actually a lot of faces. It just looks like one face. But if you control T, it'll show you how many faces it's actually made up of. And now, Super Mario Sunshine's collision is based off of triangles, and Super Mario Sunshine's visuals are based off of triangles. So when you're exporting the map, um, for the, like, the final time when you're making your final version of your map or the final version of your object, I do recommend triangulating everything by hitting control T. That way, all the collision is accurate and stuff but that's why the textures are stretched because they're getting stretched along all these invisible triangles that you just didn't see so let's say we want to fix the way it looks we can just always hit u for unwrap and then just unwrap it again easy as that now it's fixed okay so we already got a decent island going here so we can go Control b for bevel and that gives it a more naturally rounded looking thing to the hill so there's something else I want to teach you guys about and that is my favorite modifiers <sighs> mirror modifier boolean modifier and decimate modifier um, decimate I'm not sure I can show you in this video just because I don't have a practical example of where to use it I don't know how to I don't know I probably won't end up showing you that but decimate planer it's a very cool feature that will come in handy. Um, but I just want to show you a couple modifiers right now while I still have the chance. So let's make a second one. Oops, 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 oopsies. Solid tab. Okay, cool. So let's just hit D for duplicate if it wants to. Okay, no, it does not want to. Why does it not want to? D, hello, okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Frick. Uh, 
Uh, and there it goes crashing again. Well, that's freaking perfect. What we can do is we can duplicate it if it wants. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, this is just fine. That is just fine. I can ignore that for now. What is even mesh? Oh, I forget. Why is there nothing working? Oh, wait, there it goes. Okay. Well, this is really getting weird. Oh, yeah, you might have seen me doing moving this little cursor thing around. Um, to move your cursor to whatever you have selected, you hold down Shift and then S, and then you hit Cursor to Selected. Um, this just solves a couple weird issues that you'll notice eventually. Oh, it was Shift D, not just regular plain old D. Okay, Z. Okay. So now these things are both in the same mesh over here. This is the cylinder mesh that we made from earlier. Why don't we name it something actually? Let's name this hill. So you'll notice that they're both in the same object. But let's say I want to make this bottom hill a separate object. And that's always a duplicate of shift and D if I didn't mention it. So in order to make this bottom one a separate object, we have to select it first. So let's select all the stuff we want to be in a separate object. Then we hit con control and P. Oh, wait, no, it's not P. It's just P. My bad. Hit P and then P and then selection. So once you hit P and selection, that'll make it a separate object. Then you have to go out of edit mode and go back into object mode. And now they are two separate objects. So what I'm going to do really quickly is just scale. And when you're scaling, you can scale everything except Z. You can scale. I scaled everything but Z, the Z axis. So that's something you can do. So I'm just going to also, if you're moving something, like let's say you're grabbing something or scaling something, if you want to scale it at a slower pace, then hold down the shift key. And if you hold down the shift, you'll scale it slower. You'll have a little bit more control. So I'm just doing this ugly and quick just to show you an example. Um, but All right, so let's go G, Z, and then maybe G, X, Y. Y is better, yeah. So as you see, our two objects here are kind of overlapping with each other a little bit. But we don't want this. This is ugly. This is a waste of polygons, blah, 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 blah. And it also, most importantly, messes with the collision. Because the collision will think, oh, boy, I'll let you fall through the ground here because there's a wall under here and stuff stupid like that. Never underestimate how stupid collision can be. So I'm going to show you the Boolean modifier. The Boolean modifier is the world's most greatest blessing that Blender has ever given to man. Um, you go So the modifiers, you know how we have the material and the texture? Uh, the modifiers are this wrench. And you add modifiers to objects or meshes, whatever you want to call them. So you grab this bottom mesh and we go add modifier boolean and that will give this thing a boolean modifier now there's this little eyedropper that lets us select what object we're going to apply the boolean to so we're going to select the guy up here the little mini hill up here and we're going to hit z just to see what's happening with the boolean so there's different types of boolean operations there's difference which will boolean out just the difference between the two intersecting objects in this case the boolean difference would be the ground right in the hill right here and the the walls below as you can see it starts as you can see with the boolean suddenly the bottom half of the hill is actually in this object so it does that then there's then there's a union which basically uh, glues them both together back into one object, but copy and paste with a little chop, um, which is very helpful. And then there's intersect. The intersect will take the object that you have and then make it just the spots that are intersecting, which would be the little spot that went under the ground there. And yeah, so you can see they're both overlapping right now because the way I have the difference applied. Then if I go union, 
it, it does things and it does things but we're just gonna do union hit apply because that's y you get used to it over time and then i believe i should just be able to delete the little upper mountain and presto it's perfect uh yeah so you see now that i did union and then deleted the one model it cut it out of the mountainside all perfect like now this boolean is something that is really confusing at first so i encourage you to not leave something in the comment section and then just keep on trying out random dumb stupid stuff with boolean until you figure it out um yeah so that is boolean modifier so now it's all one object again because i boolean modified it and hit apply so now it's all one object instead of two objects again so now we got a little hill on our hill but you know our little island needs it needs a beach right we need a little beach so we should add uh, another cylinder let's go with another cylinder and let's go scale it and we can just hit zz to visualize it better and then we can go tab to edit go into edit mode and if you remember our control and r thing control r to get the loop cut and slide and then you can scroll your mouse wheel up to add more loops and here is where I'm going to teach you something that's absolutely insane that Blender can even do. So, let's say you want to make a shoreline that's nice and smooth. There is a lazy way to do it, and there is a extremely, extremely long way to do it that you will hate to do. And that's why I'm teaching you this stupid lazy way to do it, which is actually way better. So, I just select all the things here so I can go, okay, let me just... Let me just go ahead and hit scale. Okay, well that's not looking like a beach, so maybe we gotta make the beach slope around a little bit. Like, you know, make it actually like a slope. If, I, if it wants to blender, gosh darn it blender, I'm trying to teach people how to use you, and then you do stuff like this. Come on blender, you're better than this blender. All right, so that's not looking like a beach slope. Let's make it a little bit better. And you can do this manually, and then you can make a nice slope. But that is the way a man with two brain cells does, does it, and I do it with, like, a solid 17 brain cells at the very least. So I'm not wasting my time like that. I am showing you the proportional editing mode, which is a godsend. Um, to enable this, you just hit the letter O on your keyboard that will enable it. Then there's this. This will let you change how it proportionally edits. You can have it proportionally edit randomly, constant, linear, sharp, inverse square, root, sphere, smooth. So I'm just going to do smooth as an example. And so we can hit S for scaling. And now we can scroll our mouse wheel in and out. And that will, you know, have very cool effects. And scrolling your mouse wheel in and out affects the like range of which it has. So that, my friends, is how we are going to make our beach. We are going to use a bunch of these different options for proportional editing. Let's go with linear first. And linear does pretty much the same thing, honestly, but a little different. Um, but we would just want to find one that gives us a nice result as like a beach. You know, I feel like that could work a little bit, like the way it is looking right here. Hmm. I could make it better. And then you just have fun with this part, pretty much. Alright, that's not looking all that beachy, but I, it'll work. It'll work for whatever purpose I'm given it, you know? Um, nah. Frick it, we'll just go with this mountain and we'll chop off the top part. So, we'll just select everything, G, Shift, Z, move it a little bit away from our island part. Um, and then...
let's just chop off this little top bit that's a cancer to our little modeling society by going like this and then hitting delete well bam and it's all gone and we can delete the bottom here too because we're not going to need it And so I'm just going to control click again to get the nice big loop. And now in order to make a face where there is none, um, you can generate faces and lines and such by just hitting the F key for face. Um, and that's also how you can generate lines between things. So if I go to like vertices, I hit this guy and I shift click this guy, hit F, gives me a line. These guys hit F, that gives me a face, but there's already a face there. so. All right. So that is a thing. We got our nice dome going on here. So let's put our chunky island onto our smooth, weird island. Why don't I make it look a little bit better, though? I still don't like the way this looks as a beach. Maybe I should bring it up a little bit. All right, whatever. That's going to be beachy enough for me. And let's go back to our little island again. Oh, wait, i am got to get back into object mode before we do that. And we can just bring our island over here. And scale this up a little bit by hitting S. GZ. There we go. And now let's get some practice with that boolean again. Um. So. So let's get this guy. And then let's. Actually, let me make sure. Okay, cool. Uh, let's get the bottom guy again, the like shore of our little island here. And we are going to go boolean. And we're going to eyedropper, get our object up here, intersect, union. Then we're going to hit apply, then we're going to click the top one, we're going to hit delete, delete the top object, and now they're both one happy family again. But before we complete our little island model that we're replacing over that object from earlier, we should add some sand because there's no sand texture there's complete white nothingness that's pretty ugly for an island you know so let's go ahead and get practice getting another material in here as you can see our material from earlier for some reason is not in the list which is bugging me it's not supposed to do that oh boy it is literally not in there i don't even know how that happened probably because it crashed three times but I, I still don't know how that happened, so we're going to have to make a new material for the walls again real quick. So that's just really just some refresher. So let's go wall. Oh, wait, it's already there? Why is it giving me 001? You should have just given me wall. All right, whatever. New, open, desktop, wall texture. Cool. And then we can select everything from up here. Make sure we've got, oh, we didn't get this guy. Make sure we got all the faces. Perfect. Now wall 001, sign, and wall texture. Perfect, so that should fix that if there was any issue. Um, now, if you decide to assign the texture but you forget to assign the material um, for like a face, it'll bug out and it'll either look like the wrong material or the wrong texture. Um, so if you have it so that in your model it looks like grass, but then when you import it into the game it looks like something else, that's because either you didn't assign it the right material or you didn't assign it the right texture. So just redo that if you do have that, that error, that bug. I could probably show that bug off real quick actually. 
because there's a couple bugs I do need to show off, just because I know people would ask about that in the comment section. All right, so let's go ahead and select all the faces down here. Oh, as you can see, it took the path of least resistance when I hit control, so it went to the shortest path instead of taking the path I wanted, which is kind of funny, but then you can just do that. Because sometimes the control click does not always do what you want, but it does what it follows in its own logic. Alright, that's all the like ones we want to be sand. So let's add a new one. Let's call this sand. Let's go over here, add a new texture, and let's minimize close out of these guys. Oh, it's just sand.png, that's right. So desktop. Where is it? sand. And remember, this is our texture we got custom off the internet. So if anything does go wrong, then we can blame it on the internet. Unwrapping should be just fine for this. And remember, U for unwrap. And so now we got some sand for our little island. And now it doesn't exactly look pretty, but it is sand and it is successfully sanding. So look at that, we got our nice little island now, huh? Oh, oh boy. Actually, that kind of doesn't look bad. Kind of gives a little slope. We could, we could try that. I could show you a couple errors that happened with that, but we're not, we're not, we're not. Okay, so we want it to make this island look like it's going to be underwater. So let's make it so that we add some vertex painting to make it look like it'll actually be underwater. So I'll have to teach you about vertex painting. So you know how we've gone over object mode and edit mode? Now we have to go over this mode up here. That's vertex painting. So let's go from that to edit mode. So first to get vertex painting started, you want to select the faces that you want to vertex paint. Oh my gosh, blender. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Okay, select all of them that you want. Select them all. All right. Almost done. Perfect. All right, so now, now that we have them selected, let's go into vertex paint mode. Now, with the way it currently is, um, you should be able to just paint away with anything, any face at all, but that's kind of messes up your flow because you could be working on getting this perfect and then accidentally go up here and mess that up. So the reason I had you select all the faces is because if you hit this little checkerboard button down here, that will make it so you can only vertex paint on the things we selected. And uh, over here is our little color selector. You can select whatever color and you can save two colors at a time that's at least all i know you can probably save more i just never bothered to google it but let's have a nice light blue that's one we do need and then i like saving this to white because that's how we erase things so there's a bunch of different things here but the only ones you really need to know about is mix and add mix will allow you to color things basically and add will allow you to erase um so Let's go with the nice light blue. And the strength, let's go at like 30. That's 329, whatever. So now we can you can see we're adding just a little bit of blue to the bottom there. Now we probably want to add a lot more blue to the bottom. So let's go let's go like halfway so we can see the change a little bit more. And so now you can see we're really making it look blue. Uh, vertex painting, you can think of it as like spray painting over top of the model. You're taking your can of spray paint and you're spray painting over top of just the vertex and that data is stored in the model's file and it lets it look a little bit better than had you not vertex painted it. So we're just giving this a little bit of Bob Ross. 
painting it up, making it look a little bit more islandy. Good enough. What do you say? I think that looks good enough. Plenty of blue to it. Well, probably, it'll probably look different in game, but this is good enough for like a little test object for you guys to learn with. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. Object mode. Edit mode. So yeah, we got this nice object just going on. It's, it's pretty nice. All right, I think we're just about ready to import it into the game. But there is a couple steps left to take. I know that much. Thinking if there's anything else I really need to explain to you. Uh, I should probably explain the mirror modifier because I didn't explain that. But um, over back at our little wrench, our blue wrench over here for modifiers, you can add this modifier called mirror uh where is it mirror and that will create a mirrored version of whatever object you have selected and it's very helpful for quickly remodeling something for something with symmetry but we're not doing that so all right so i'm feeling like we're pretty done with this uh custom object right now at least for our first custom object we're ever going to make and then we'll probably just test import this as a stage itself so that you guys can get around to making a stage. And then I'll put some objects in it. We'll have a good time. Um, but this is back where, like, 0, 0, 0 is. So let's go bring that back home. All right. G, Shift, Z. It's probably good enough. So, let's bring back our block into view. Oh my gosh, we have one tiny island. This block, this island, isn't even as big as the freaking Mario block. Okay, so clearly we have an issue. Um, but we have, actually, there's a couple things I should mention. Um, let's go see. The cylinder, which is our island. Tab. Eh. And then we can go into Z so we can actually see what we're up to. And we can scale this up. Now, here's the thing. Um, in Mario Sunshine, when an object is out of your plane of sight, like out of your line of vision, it gets deloaded. So if we were to have the model for this object, like way out here, when compared to the visual over here, then it's going to get deloaded while we're like standing on it. So if we're going to make a custom object, the custom object has to fit inside of here. But that's not a problem because we can make it bigger in the level editor. Um, which I'll be showing you how to do in a little bit. So we'll just bring this guy over top of here. Make sure he kind of fits in generally so. If it's a little bit bigger, don't worry. But if it's a lot bigger, you're going to have some weird rendering issues. All right. It's about the same size. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to say goodbye to this original cube. We don't need them anymore. All right. So if we were to import this into Mario Sunshine the way it is, it would end up being extremely tiny, like probably like this tiny. It'd be like super mega tiny. The reason being for that is that for whatever reason, if you want the scaling, the size, to actually match what it is in Blender, to match what it is in game, you have to hold down Control and hit... Actually, you have to hold down... Is it Control? It is... Yeah, okay. You have to hold down Control and then press A, and then you have to press Location, then you go Rotation Scale. So Control A, Location, Rotation Scale. Otherwise... Otherwise, the object will be in a completely different position, it'll be a completely different rotation, and it'll be at a completely different size. So whenever you export any model with Blender, before you export it, make sure to hit Control A, Location, Rotation, Scale. Um, 
Uh, okay, that's something else I should teach is normals. So while we can see, it, like, you know how you can see it, you can see the, the uh, sand from out here, and you can also see the sand from inside the mountain. Um, in Mario Sunshine, you can only see the sand from out here, and you can never see it from the other side. Uh, and that's because of this thing called normals. And normals are the direction that the faces are facing. So if we grab this face right here, and we go mesh, normals, flip normals, you'll notice that it has a different look to it when you move around the camera. It has this darkness that just hovers over it. If you have that, that means that face is facing backwards. So we'll make a backwards facing face just to show you what's up so that you know when this happens to one of your levels. So let's go with this face right here. We'll go mesh, normals, flip normals, and you'll see the issue with it in game. Let me actually flip that guy back. But you'll see the issue with it in game. Ooh, that is one more thing I did forget to go over really quick. We are going to go over collision values and such and the likes. So in the link in the description, you'll find this web page right here. Um, let me go to that in uh, Google's. Boom, bang. So what this has right here, and this is how you use collision in Mario Sunshine is there's a bunch of different numbers. These are the collision values, and that will tell you what material has what type of collision. So zero is normal collision, one is slippery, blah, 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 blah. So you can take a look through this yourself. Um, there's going to be a lot of useful collision. And then also at the bottom is the sand, the, the sand, <laughs> the sound that the collision makes. And there's the value for that. So let's see here. We want the sand, if we can go over to our materials, we want the sand to have sand collision. So let's go over to our collision docs and let's find sand. Sand makes sound number five. So let's give, and if you go to your material and then you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there should be, huh, where to go? Oh. Uh, apparently, when it crashed, it also uninstalled the uh, add-ons. So let me just quickly reinstall those real quick. Desktop. Bone 2.79, 2.79, scripts, mm, 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 modules. Okay, and I'll just copy that so I can quickly. Okay, hopefully that fixes it. No, well, ain't that fun. Well, I mean, I still showed you how to do it in the tutorial, so let me just real quick figure out how to do that. I'll chop this out of the video.
Alright people, I got it back. <laughs> Sorry for that, that was really weird. I don't know why I just suddenly decided to uninstall it, but y y you get the gist. Um, so, we go over to our sand material. I don't even know why I was going for the... the okay, well, we go to sand material, and sound was 5, if I remember. So now our sand material will make the sand noise, Delfino Plaza Beach. Now let's find the sand collision up at the top. Blah, 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 slide, water, blah, 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 sand. And it has this value. This is one heck of a value for sand. Right, sand, and then we go to collision type, hidden sand. So now this beach actually has sand collision type, and it'll make the sand noise when you step on it. So let's go to wall. And for the wall... There's a special collision type I'd like to use, and the no camera clipping. This means that when you move your camera up against the wall, it won't go right through the wall, which is very handy. So we'll go with that for our wall collision. And again, we'll put that in collision type. Paste that in there. Oh, whoa, I took some square with me, didn't I? Uh, 40960, 40960, so just without the square. I do not how you got a square in there, blender, but okay. And then sound. We will find the sound for grass, because that's what you're going to be walking on. Normal stone, blah, 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 there. Grass, 16. So we got 16 for the grass. Sound, 16. Perfect. So that should have us all set up and ready to go to export this as a visual model and a collision model. But as I was saying earlier, always a good measure to just quick triangulate it before you export it into the game. Now, with when you're exporting as a collision file, uh, sometimes when you're exporting the collision, you, ne you need to be in edit mode. Otherwise, it just crashes sometimes. Um, it's really weird. I have no clue why it does it. I even asked Augs, the guy who created it, why it does it, and he just says, I have no clue. It just doesn't do it sometimes. Um, so, uh, anyways, if you're exporting collision, you might want to put it in edit mode first. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to hit File, Export, and then we're going to go down to Collision. And we will name this, and we'll go to our desktop. Um, we'll just name it map.collision. And that's what you want to name it. You want to name it that. Now, let's go ahead and File, Export, BMD, and we'll name it map, whoop, mass, map.bmd at the desktop. Perfect. It takes a little bit, the, the map.bmd takes a little bit longer to export than the collision, um, but so let me drag those over to our screen over here where you actually see it. Perfect, so now we got the map and the collision. Actually, why did I name the map? <laughs> I'm doing this over the normal block. I need to name it normal block. <laughs> I was thinking about the stage. <laughs> um, so let's go N-O-R-M-A-L-B-L-O-C-K. And we can just control copy that. And normal block dot collision, normal block dot BMD. So now, what, now that we have this, finally we have our model complete, we can go over back to our SMS manager from ages ago, go to scene, file, open project, open our project, and then we can find our handy dandy airport level, and we go over to go to folder, to so go to the airport levels folder. Now what we want to do is we want to go to map objects, and this will get us all the objects. And what we want to do is we want to grab our two from that we generated for our island. And we go over in here, and we just hit replace. And that will replace the default object with our custom one. So what we want to do to get the normal block actually in the level is we want to find the normal block somewhere else in some other stage. And if I remember, I believe it was like 23. One of the Dolpic EX stages has a normal block in it. Oof, not that one. Uh, probably EX1, if I remember. Or maybe it was zero, I can't remember. Not one, let's try zero. Nope, 
Nope, that is actually the endgame airstrip. Four? Ooh, not four, that is poison lily pad. Was it three? Did I already check three? I did already check three. Okay. What about two? Did I check two? Uh, that's Pachinko. Not fun. Did I already do four? I'm pretty sure I already did four. Yeah, I did four already. We need five. Oh, hello. Did I already open 25? Oh wait, 25 is unused, that's right. Um, it was probably one of them down here. I don't know, we'll find it, just give me a sec. Oh wait, was it Bianca one? Bianca zero? Bianca one? My freaking goodness, it's Bianco 1. Why would they put this in Bianco? All right. All right, so in Bianco 1, we have Bianco underscore EX1. We have a different version of the normal block, but it'll work just the same. So here's something to know about the uh, bin editor and all the things we have in it. There's separated into groups. This top group has the managers, which are very important to getting things to work that are like NPCs and enemies. Um, there's a bunch of other random stuff I really just ignore. Then the first object group, object group zero, is for like weird objects, like massive objects sometimes. Like in Rico Harbor, I believe the cages are a group uh, zero type object. Um, Group 1 apparently is just the sun. And then ID group 2 is stuff. Uh, stuff. Um, ID group 3 is the objects group, which is what we're going to be doing because we need our normal block. So we're going to copy the normal block from this level. But I'll still explain the rest. Um, ID group 4 apparently is pollution. Um, this one is ID group 5, which is collectibles like shines. Um, one-up mushrooms, although coins, suspiciously, are actually object group class, classes objects instead of collectibles. Um, yeah, then this group is Mario's, like Sh Mario, Shadow Mario, PNTCMO, they're both Mario-type things. And then seven is for enemies. I believe either eight or, no, it was group nine is for NPCs, like the Nokis, the Piantas, and Peach, and the Toads. And then, uh, this ID group ID group 11 is for like graphical effects and stuff um like the water fountains at the start of the bin at the start of the level um so yeah that's just the basic rundown of the groups and you want to make sure you put your object in the object group and you put your enemies in the enemy group and everything um so now that we have our custom object and we have it saved inside the level, and we have a normal object copied, we can go over to our objects group, which again is three, and we can hit paste, we hit go to, and we realize we done messed up, and our object is really, really weird. So let's just bring that back to one, 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 because that's not, that's not us. Um, so this is what happens when you misassign a material. So we gave the sand uh, a sand texture so it looks normal in Blender, but we forgot to assign the sand the material. We forgot to assign it the sand material. So it ended up coming out all weird and bugged like this, and it just looks, <laughs> it looks ridiculous. So you can at least see that the blue coloring we gave to the sides of it has worked plenty well, though. So you can see how it's a little bit more blue at the bottom than it is up the top. So that worked at least. Uh, so let's re-export the visual model and the collision model and try this again. Oh, and look at that. Our island is working just fine. Oh, we should have put the dab Pianta on there. We should have put dab Pianta. 
Dab. I gotta do it. Yeet. Okay. We have dab. So there is one thing you might notice if we oh my gosh, we have gotten the world's most luckiest collision. My goodness. Okay, so usually, um, water collision freaking hates slopes. Usually. But somehow, uh, the water collision is working freaking perfectly. And so is the freaking slope. Gosh, dang it, man. I was really expecting, like, three times worse. I was really expecting that to be horrible. But as you can see, Mario's making little footprints in the sand because we gave it sand collision. This is working out, like, ten times better than I thought it would. Alright, so, you know how I was talking about the normals? Well, if I go over to ZZ, and you know how I was talking about this one face right here that's darker, and how there's this thing called normals, and that you go over, you click them, and you go to mesh, then you go to normals, and you hit flip normals to fix it? Um, essentially, what happens is, this wall generates, but... It generates backwards. And the collision is backwards too. Like I can I can straight up fall through that. No problem. Um, but if I went through it backwards, I'd bonk into it. So yeah, that's something to watch out for when you're making collisions. But this worked out surprisingly well. Oh tree, would you mind if I could climb you? Thank you. This was a very, very good thing to start with the tutorial, I feel. And you, you, you see, this was all just by replacing a re regular old freaking box object. Like, the potential for custom objects in SMS is pretty much limitless, honestly. Like, you can make an object that's literally just an island. Like, you can literally add to the stage's collision without ever editing it. Like, you can just make objects that edit the collision. Which I think is just really impressive that you can even do this. Alright, uh, so I have done a little bit of stuff off camera, but let me just explain what it, what the heck is going on here. So, I want to showcase both the uh, water collision and the death plane collision. So, the death plane collision has a collision value of 0, 2, I mean 2, 0, 4, 8, and then the regular ground collision, this is just a separate one I copied from another stage I made in the past, but it's just regular ground collision. Um, and I will explain something real quick, but you might notice that I've added an extra pair of floor beneath the ocean floor. Um, this is because um, in Mario Sunshine, let me just model this up real quick. Um, Shift A, Let's go at plane, because it's much easier to make a visualization than just explain it by ta yapping for 12 seconds. But let's go here, and let's press period. Control R to cut, loop, and slide. Okay, never mind, it doesn't want to. Um, oh, am I in, I'm in object mode, no wonder it doesn't want to. Okay, control, no, oh, control R, boom. Oh, wait, did it even? There we go, okay. So then let's grab this face right here, GZ, okay. So let me explain a little bit of the way the collision engine works in Sunshine. Um, so we have a nice little slope here, and we have it out here in the middle of nowhere, not over top of any collision, just an endless pit right there. Um, but So what we have here is a face, a angled face, which is going to make this like mountain right here, and then the floor, like a floor, a mountain, and a floor. So with a slope that is very weak, this usually never happens with a slope that is weak, but with a strong slope that's like very, you know, obtuse, I guess, for this angle, and then obtuse for this angle too, um, you know, with a strong slope, um, there will be invisible walls. With the stronger the slope, the higher the tendency that there will be invisible walls that generate uh, here like this. All right, so that's just a way to visualize it. With a higher slope, there's a chance that there's invisible walls that generate at these like specific spots. Um, just the general rule of thumb. So why is it that slopes cause this? Well, the way the game d checks for collision, essentially when the game has a slope like this, um, 
what what the game actually sees is this is what the collision in is programmed to see. So when you walk over to the edge of a map, so let's say we got our map right here, and this is the edge of the ocean. This is the edge right here. So if you were to jump up against the edge of this ocean we have made, you'll hit an invisible wall. Anything that doesn't have a polygon below it will just generate an invisible wall that cannot be passed. So no matter where we go in our map currently, um, you just hit an invisible wall if you hit the edges that are like this gray edge. You see where it's all gray and it's just nothingness? You try walking into that area, then you'll just get hit by an invisible wall. Um, so since the game registers the, detection, the, the collision detection like this, when it has a steep slope, it says, oh, there's an invisible wall here. So that's why you end up bonking off of invisible walls with steep slopes, because there's no ground underneath it. So in order to fix this issue, um, we essentially put a giant, oops, um, cursor to selected, we put a, gosh darn it, could I please visualize this blender? There we go. We essentially put a giant regular thing of floor underneath it. That way the game says, well, there is floor, so it just lets you go right past. It says there's no invisible wall there because there's floor below it. So that's a basic rundown of why we have a second set of floor underneath our first set of floor. Um, it prevents invisible walls. And in fact, I've been told that regular Mario Sunshine has this in their stages as well. Um, so this is actually a trick that was used by the developers, according to some people on the Sunshine Hut. Um, so yeah, that's um, basically all I need to explain about that part of the collision. Um, so I can hit delete on that. Perfect, I didn't delete anything else. So now, now that you got that piece of knowledge, um, here's what I gotta explain about the death plane collision. So you know how I said that if there's not a piece of collision, then there's just going to be an invisible wall there? Well, the death plane collision doesn't even register as placing, like, a collision there. The death plane collision type doesn't have any actual, like, physical collision. It's just like a wall that d detects whether you pass it or not. So, in order to get it to actually generate an open space and not just be a bunch of invisible walls like everywhere else that's not a stage, you have to place a little piece of ground below the death plane. If you don't put a little piece of ground underneath the death plane, you'll just get an invisible wall the second you try and jump off. Um, that, and also something else to be noted, is if you fall through a death plane and the floor is too close to the death plane, Mario will just slide along the floor after passing the death plane, which looks very bad and unprofessional. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take that death plane and lower it a whole lot, or at least a decent bit, a decent bit. So, yeah, so that's how you create a death plane, and that is how you prevent slopes from causing invisible walls. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to export these, uh, to map and collision files. So I'm in edit mode, so now I can export collision, map.collision, now I can tab, go back here, and what we want to do is, since this is going to look ugly in our visual model, let's just take these two and delete them before we export the visual model. So we'll just go export, uh, bmd, map.bmd, boom, done, and we can just hit undo. I'm going to hit uh, save real quick. Yes, and now we got our map and collision files. Now, I was doing some testing with this earlier, and uh, the airport stage is not all that friendly to custom stage imports, <laughs> to say the least. It started crashing, but I did test it out on Gelato Beach Mission 1, which is Mama O, and it seems to work fine. So we're going to go to folder, we're going to hit map, we're going to go over and we're going to take our collision. Oh, whoop, I didn't want to take both, thank you very much. We're gonna take the collision, we're gonna put it in there, and we're gonna go over into this map folder, and then we're gonna put the map in here, and we're gonna hit replace. That replaces the original stages map data. Um, I also cleared out the scene.bin for this one, so it's all an empty map with nothing but the island. And one thing I should explain, um, let me find a stage that has it though, which should be airport one, scene map. So, if we go to the map data of 
air, the airport stage, we can see we have a map.bmd and a map.btk. So what the map.btk is, the map.btk is like a file that stores like animation data and other data for a stage. And the map.btk relies, it's like a leech, it like leeches off of the map.bmd. And so if you make your own custom map.bmd, this thing will try and leech, leech off of your custom one, but it'll be a custom stage, so it doesn't have the things that it needs to leech onto, because you didn't add the leeching mode or whatever. So essentially, if you have two things named map, and you want to delete the other one that's not the BMD. If you made a custom stage that's map.bmd, you want to delete the other things that say map in the folder, otherwise your game's going to crash. Same thing goes for C. If we make a custom C.bmd, you want to delete the C.btk, this indirect blah, 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 blah. And then you can just re-put them back in and see what doesn't crash or what does crash. Um, but yeah, that's that's just a rundown of something that does cause a crash sometimes. Also, um, something to note is something that I have figured out um, prevents you from uploading a custom stage is if we go to Bianco here, let's just go to Bianco Hills Mission 1. I was editing the collision of uh, Bianco Hills like a month ago or so i'd like to say and i figured out that you know how like this hill in uh, bianco hills has this like polluted thing where it's stuck under the ground and then you kill the polluted piranha and then it pops out of the ground and you collect the shine well anything that has this like landmass that pops out of the ground um any stage that has that sort of feature will 100 percent crash if you make a custom stage i don't know why but I think you can delete some files in there and fix it, but I don't know. I'm too lazy to explain that. I just know that that's something that you should want to watch out for. I just realized I was doing this on the wrong freaking screen again. Gosh dang it. But you know, this hill that pops out right here. Get the shine. Yeah, any stage with that uh, usually ends up crashing your custom stage. But Gelato Beach doesn't have any of that, so we're good. Um, so let's go to... So we put the new collision in there. So let me show you what the stage looks like in the editor. It's very bland. I deleted all the objects out of uh, the beach, except for, well, the map. The map is still here, and Mario's spawn location is still here. But every other object has been removed. Uh, very bare bones, very basic. But that's what the purposes of a tutorial, tutorial really is, so... Um, yeah. Alright, so this is our stage loading in game just fine. Going well. So I mentioned a couple issues that might appear, so I'm gonna show them right now. Slope looks like it's working good, but is it really? Go over here. Nope, you fall right through. That is an issue with slopes and water collision interacting, because slopes and water collision hate each other. Also, our water here is not transparent whatsoever, which is just wonderful, but I will show you how to fix that. Um, and then finally, we have our uh, death plane. Let's see if that works. And it works perfectly. The spots where the shore and the water met were pretty buggy and the water just did not have it. The water just did not like it. So what we want to do is we want to get our good old friendly boolean modifier out. Uh, boolean. And then we select the island as our object to boolean against the water. And as you can see, the water has now made itself a puddle under the island, but we want the exact opposite. So if we go difference, I believe that should fix it. There we go. So now there's no water collision underneath the island. And that sometimes fixes it. And I say sometimes because water is extremely buggy no matter how much you try. Water absolutely hates, 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 hates collision for some reason. And you'd think maybe they'd program the water really good in the one video game that's focused on it. The one Mario game that's all about water. You'd think they'd program the water great. But apparently not. <laughs> apparently not. Alright. So now that we got this little ring around the island, and there's no water underneath the island, um, what you want to do is you want to expand it just ever so slightly. So let's scale, and then shift Z just for safe measure. Um, and just make it ever so slightly out so that it's like not touching the collision. That even might be a little too much. So let's go scale, shift, Z, bring that back in until you really, yeah. But you don't want it to be touching too much. You want it not to be like touching the collision, but just hovering directly over it. And not so far out that you can just walk straight underneath the water with no issue. Um, so 
having it a little bit separated should uh, remove any issues with slopes and water, and uh, removing the water from out from underneath the island should also help fix that too. Um, sometimes you get lucky and it just doesn't have problems, but 99% of the time you're going to have weird slope water collision issues there. So we're just going to export this as a collision again. Now that we have fixed that collision ex issue, we go export collision map.col. Okay. And we are going to go to the stage, which is Mama O for the first gelato beach mission. We're going to go to edit, go to folder, not edit scene up. And I was going to, just going to say that map, map, actually not map, map, not yet. We are just going to put our new collision file right back in there to replace our old one. So now we can fix the water. Now, to fix the transparency is a whole nother uh, issue. So I have this uh, link right here in the description. Uh, this is Re Studios or whatever the frick they call it nowadays. Um, and this is a website that uh, essentially allows you to fix the transparency. Um, so let's go to our maps visual model, which is in the map map, you know. Um, we bring the map, drag and drop, boom, that will give us the stage in this weird program. So now you can see our beautiful little island with our beautiful little, beautiful little death pit over here. You can just fall right off the edge. And it's all looking pretty darn swell, you know? Not too, not too shabby if I do say so myself. Um, so we got our water thing right down here. We want to ignore the one at the bottom and just go to the ones over here. Um, what you want to do is there's this tab, J3D data. You want to take this flag, flag, and make it from one to four. Very random. Then if we go over to pixel, um, we have alpha comparison. And then under here, we have pixel alpha, always pass. And we want to make both, make sure both of them are always pass. Once you have done these two completely random things, hit file, save, and then that'll generate a new map.bmd. So we can press show in folder to grab that. And then we have this new one, replace the old one. All right, so we are at the stage again, and as you can see, you can actually see through the water this time. Now, is our slopes fixed? They sure should be. I'm not falling through anywhere, and I'm easily going into the water like a charm. And you're not just walking under the water, you're actually going into the water, and it's working exactly as intended, which is perfect. So now, you might notice we have this weird cartoony Mario Kart Double Dash texture for our water. And now that does work, but wouldn't it be awesome if we got the actual texture from Mario Sunshine, the whole wave and all the custom stuff with the wave, actually in the stage? This is going to be probably the most complex thing in this tutorial. Okay, so for custom water, I've included this customwater.zip in the downloads in the link in the description. And uh, this contains a bunch of files, c.bmd, c.btk, c.indirect.bmd, c.indirect.btk. So, what we want you to do with these folders, if you want to get some nice fancy custom water, I first want you to find that level that you're making, you're working on, which I'll just do our tutorial stage for the heck of it. And, uh, we can go to... Scene B, uh, not Bianco, it's Gelato Mama. Open folder. And now we want to go to map, map, and this holds all the C files here. So take your stage that you're working on, find all the C files. I want you to hit delete right away, just delete them all. Get them out, and then replace them with these custom ones I have provided. Copy them, and then you can just paste them right on in. Now, what I want you to do to get this to work is a little bit complex. This is, once again, probably the most complex part of the entire process. So we're going to take these this c.bmd file specifically. We're going to copy it. We're going to create a new folder. We're just going to name this work in progress water. And in here, we're just going to paste that right in. And if you remember way back in the beginning of the tutorial, pretty much, um, we dragged and dropped a model into SuperBMD to just extract its data. So we go drag and drop it into Super B and BMD, and we're extracting the fancy water that SMS uses and extracting its model. Um, 
So this custom water that I had you extract is actually from one of my custom stages, but it's the only water that I've been able to replicate not crashing. <laughs> so uh, that's why I have to include it. I don't know why I cannot get any other type of water to not crash, which is kind of sad. Um, but yeah, there is one thing I have to do with this model right here before I... I gotta clean it up a little bit. So if there's a problem with your model not exporting by Super BMD, this is one thing I figured out really recently that it, that can cause it. Um, if we go to select all by trait and then loose geometry, um, sometimes if you have like just a couple of things of like random geometry that's just not actually supposed to be a thing, um, just deleting it uh, sometimes actually fixes your thing from not importing. Just finding that button there and select. Um, select all by tree, trait, loose geometry, then deleting it. That sometimes fixes um, collision models. Um, but yeah, and then you can hit W to remove vertices, and that should clean up some stuff too. Um, but, you know, model cleaning, that's another topic for another day. Um, so what we want to do to get this water to actually work correctly is we want to import that water we just dumped. So we go to our work in progress water folder, our c.dae that we just dumped. And so as you can see, the one that we just dumped is white, so we can gz. Uh, oh, no, that's not what we wanted. We can uh, gz, there we go. Oh my gosh, gz, thank you, come on. All right, cool. So as you can see, uh, we have our water. This is for a stage I'm working on called Splash Park, basically. Um, so it's a water freaking stage with water park. Anyways, you'll notice that the water park's water collision has a very unique name to it for the material. It has MO underscore MO8. Um, for some reason, uh, it's Blender sometimes decides to generate this little MO before it. Um, so just delete the MO. It's underscore MO8. This is very important. Make sure you name this material that this little droplet of water thing is using and make sure you name it underscore m08 that is vitally important okay all right so now that that's done we want to take the one that we're working on and the bottom one this one that we we imported um we want to control j to join them so control j boom if you hold down control hit j that makes it one object um so we go to the water and uh with the water, we want to make sure that everything is assigned to this M underscore M08. So we hit the M underscore 08. We can hit tab, go select everything in the object, and M underscore 08, assign, 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 assign. You want to assign that to M underscore 08. And uh, one thing to uh, definitely keep in mind when making Oh my gosh, there's so much stuff. My goodness. All right, cool. Oh my gosh, it keeps showing up. Why don't I just Z, B, Haya, and delete. I just, yes. Awesome, cool. So that should be, <laughs> that should be gone. <laughs> One thing to note, um, when you're making custom water, and this is specifically for if you're making this like the ocean. If you're making like a puddle of water up on a cliff, just disregard what I'm saying here. But if you're making the ocean, the ocean water should be at the exact height of zero or like very close to the height of zero. Um, so if I go to my 3D cursor and I put my 3D cursor on the water collision, you can see my water collision is pretty darn close to zero on the z-axis. Um, you want to make sure that your water is pretty darn close to zero on the z-axis, or otherwise you'll get this weird green mist that just kind of, like, applies to your level. And it's very ugly and not cool. So, yeah, definitely make sure that your water's at, like, z-zero. Um, and you can just check it by the 3D cursor thing in the N panel by hitting N, 3D cursor, and you can just click on your water, and that'll show you where the 3D cursor position is. Um, it's not perfectly accurate, but that just gets you a general idea, because I believe it does click onto your face pretty well, but, or maybe not, it seems pretty random, honestly, but, uh, either way, you do want to make sure that your thing's, ob your object is actually at, like, pretty much Z0, and it is, 
looks like it. For as I'm going to global, and it looks like it is at Z, like, zero, pretty much. So I'm pretty good with the water there. But you, you do want to make sure the ocean water is at Z, zero. I'm saying this a bunch of times just to stress it out because it's very important. Um, so, yeah, now that we have this and we have it assigned to the underscore M08, we can hit file, and you want to export not as collision, not as BMD, but you want to export it as DAE. And you want to go back to our water folder from earlier with the C.DAE. I mean, the C.BMD that we extracted, and then there's the C.DE. So we can rename this to whatever we want, really. But let's just, for the sake of tutorial, we'll name this um, custom water .DAE. All right, and it says exported two objects. That's a problem. It needs to be one object. I just realized I forgot to delete the skeleton root. Um, that's a part of the model that we imported. So let's just quickly hit if it wants to work any day now, Blender, any day. Okay, there we go. Delete. So now we just have our water right here. So now let's uh, try that again. Export DAE and then we go to our work in progress water, our custom water. Okay, export one object. Perfect. All right, so now in here we have, we should have custom water.da. That's perfect. That's what we want. So our super BMD, which we used to uh, dump the model in the first place, we want to grab this folder, open it up for a little bit. We're going to go to our search button. We're going to type in CMD to enter the command prompt. We're going to type in CD and then the space bar. And now you want to take the address of your uh, C folder that we made earlier. And you want to paste that in after putting the CD space, paste that in. Then you want to hit enter. After hitting enter, you want to copy the folder to your super BMD. You take the address and you copy it, everything but the first two things, the C and the double dot. You want to copy everything else. You just hit control copy and we can close out of this now. So when now we've done that, we paste it in here. Then after that, we type in backslash super bmd dot exe and now after that we hit another space bar and then what we want to do is tell it what model we want to turn into a bmd so we take our custom water dot dae we're going to name that control all control copy and then we put that in there custom water dot dae then we put a space bar and then we can put in c dot bmd after we put in c dot bmd with a little space in between we hit spacebar again, then we put in dash dash, and then M-A-T for material, and then we have C underscore materials.json, we get the name for that real quick, and then we give it the material name that we want to use, uh, except we put a spacebar between the mat, which I failed to do. Um, there we go, so we got, now that's dash dash mat, space, C underscore materials.json, now we spacebar, dash dash t e x h e a d e r text header and then space bar now we do the same but for the text header all right we paste that in there let's give it the name and now we press another space bar and then we type in dash dash r o t a t e for rotate so that is a mouthful i know i've been talking pretty fast so let me explain what the frick I am talking about here. Um, so what we're telling it to do is we're telling it to take, go to this folder, the work in progress water folder. So we're, it tells the computer to go to this folder. Then it tells it to use this program called super BMD from this different folder. And now it tells us to, it'll take, now uh, we tell it using the super BMD.exe file, it tell, we tell it to take the model customwater.dae, take that model, and then turn that model into c.bmd. But then the dash dash mat and then this, the name of the file means that we add the material properties, which was this file, and then we have the text header uh, and we have this file. So essentially what's going on is we are taking our model, turning it into a bmd, and then applying the um, animated water textures using this these weird JSON files. Um, so if everything works out... Oh, and the dash dash rotate is just to make sure that it's oriented correctly. Um, so if everything works out correctly, we should just be able to hit the enter key, and this will generate our fancy custom water. 
Did I not hit the enter key? I guess I didn't. Okay. <laughs> That's weird. Um, so if you got everything correctly, it should say generating the joins, finishing the job, first is complete. So we can just minimize this in case we need to get back to it, but I doubt it. So we take our C.BMD that we newly generated. We hit copy. And now we can minimize that as well. Let's go back to the stage that we're making the custom water for. Go to map, map, and then we paste it in here and replace. And then replace. Place button, there we go. And unlike the map, you do want to keep the C.BGK and the C indirects. Unlike the map where you want to delete this map.BGK and all that stuff. All right, so there you can see it. We have the fancy water in there, although I did delete, I did forget to delete the cartoony water over top of it, so it's glitching all out and looking stupid. Um, so let me go do that real quick. All right, so you can see we have successfully generated custom water. And it is animated and everything. Like if we get the camera to stay still, you can see the water is animated. It's really nice. Looks really freaking good. Nice custom water. And now I was mentioning this like green stuff, this like green mist. So you see how the second the camera goes underneath the water, you can see the island goes from like, you know, regular island looking. Then you go underwater and suddenly it, it goes green. <laughs> so that green effect, that green effect happens at exactly height zero. So that's why your water needs to be, for the ocean, the ocean water needs to be at pretty much exactly zero. Otherwise you'll have the green fog up above your stage and it just doesn't look good at all <laughs> not in the slightest but yeah so this is pretty much our tutorial stage all done and finished um i should probably show off how to add a this is our level that we've been working on for a while and i will leave the finished level in the uh, description so that you can modify it test it do whatever you want with it But here's our little island, but it's feeling pretty empty, pretty lonely. Um, so let me show you how you add objects. Um, I did show it earlier, but it's always good to show it again. Um, there is actually two methods of showing objects, so I might as well show you off that. So there's this thing called the wizard. And there's this button that says backup objects assets into assets, edit assets folder. Essentially what that does is it'll take the stage that's currently loaded and it'll back up all the objects into a bank and it'll store all the enemy objects, the trees, the everything, and stores it into this like virtual bank. And then later, once you have your bank stored up, you can just uh, add the object back in by just hitting wizard and there should be like another option. And it just says, insert this object, which is very handy. And I'm sure uh, if uh, Rhythm gets around to his tutorial, he'll probably explain that a little bit too, because I think he uses it more than I do, because I do not trust the wizard at all. Because if you've ever met a wizard in real life, you'll know that he has magic spells. And you see, the magic spells work really well when you're casting the spells, but when the spells get cast on you, uh, things don't tend to go so well. And that's the problem with the wizard. Half the time you do anything with the wizard, the object you add will just crash. But then if you do it the normal way, which I'm going to show you, your objects, like, never crash. Um, or at least they shouldn't crash too often. Um, but another thing to note about Mario Sunshine is, for the most part, uh, crashes will be happening due to your map collision. And, like, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's, like, the map collision. And then that other, like, 0.1% of the time, the crash is due to some stupid thing you put in the level. Um... But I'm just going to tell you right now, there's a lot more that goes wrong with making the stage than there is with uh, putting the objects in it. <laughs> so, what we want to do right now is we're going to add some things in this level to do. Um, without things to do, there's not much of a level. So, <laughs> let's go over back to, um, let's see if level that has a nice shine out in the open. Rico. So we can go to Rico Mission one and we can go edit scene.bin now there are a few objects that you don't have to copy and paste the object data at all and those are things like coins and shine sprites and uh, a couple other things like the watermelon block and secret courses for some reason um, but there are a couple objects that are just by default in every single stage in the game and you don't really have to worry about uh, and shine sprites are one of those exceptions 
one of those objects that you just don't have to worry about. And I forgot, I am not on Sunburn, so I actually have to find the mission that has it. Yippee! I guess I'll just do mission 8. Uh, edit scene up bin. Great. So we got Rico Harbor. So let's give ourselves a shine sprite to collect in the stage. So, um, whoa, game, hello. Uh, okay, there's the shine sprite up here in the cage. Oh, I just selected the orange seal. I want to select the shine sprite. Thank you. All right, so this is our shine. And we can just hit copy. And the shine ID should be the, like, actual ID for the shine. So, uh, like, that's telling you that this is, like, shine 17 out of all 120 shines and, and such. I'm pretty sure that's what the uh, shine ID does. And uh, camera, uh, if it's negative 1 or 0, is, like, the orientation of the camera data for it. But for shine sprites, the camera data just kind of like auto focuses on it and just kind of ignores your camera data. So it's actually pretty easy. You can ignore that. Um, then there's model, which is the shine, and there's type. There's two types of shines. There is normal and there is a demo. Demo is for stuff like red coins and pretty much every shine in the game where the shine spawns instead of just being out in the open. If the shine is out in the open, it'll be a normal shine, whereas if it spawns as a result of something, it will be a demo type. Um, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to keep it simple. We're just going to use a regular shine sprite. Especially because I don't have the uh, SB script. Actually, wait, do I have the SB script? I probably could do the SB script right now. But nah, I shouldn't. It would just be overcomplicating things. And I believe the object class above Mario was the shine sprite, but I just need to double check real quick. Because I did clear that map of literally every object, so. Alright, yeah, the one above Mario is the Shine Sprites. So this Mario group, we go to the next group up, that's the Shine Sprites, 1-ups, and uh, that's pretty much the entire group, it's just Shine Sprites and 1-ups. Um, so we can hit Go To, and we can find our Shine, it's up in the sky over here, so let's bring it back down to Earth. And let's make the end of the level uh, this little spot of land over here. Perfect. Alright. So what you can do with these uh, objects is with objects, you can rotate them. So we got yaw, which we've just put that at 90, and you can see what it does. Or 99, that works too. So that rotates it along like that axis. Uh, pitch, let's do like 45, I guess. Rotates it along that axis. And roll rotates it along that axis. Whichever one that is. Oh, wait, actually, I have the other ones not cleared yet. Okay, y'all ro rotates it along that axis. So if we go back to 0, then back to 45, it rotates it along that. Um, some objects can't be rotated, some objects can't be scaled, but most of them actually can be scaled and can be rotated pretty well, actually. So let's just get this shine sprite to face the right direction which would be yaw, so let's go yaw minus 90, I believe, yes, I was right. All right, so then we're gonna just give it a nice position. And personally, I like, you see this box, this red box, I personally put the shine sprites just so that the bottom of the red box uh, just clips into the ground just a little bit. And that's pretty much the perfect height for a shine sprite. Um, so one thing we might wanna add is an object or two for you to like, you know, explore, have fun with. So I'm going to go grab uh, something from the second airport scene. So let's just find something interesting that Mario can interact with. Um, trees. Trees are easy to interact with. They have a bunch of files and a bunch of parts. But palm, let's hit copy. And that's just taking the object. And we take note of the object group, which is ID3. All right, so we've got to remember that. So let's go back and edit our scene again. And let's find object group three. Paste in there our palm tree. Perfect. Um, now, for all stages, there's not, not in every single stage does the palm tree just be there by default. 
sometimes you have to manually put in the palm tree and I'm about to show you that um, how to manually put in this palm tree and again the wizard does this stuff automatically but sometimes it just crashes the game so I do not recommend wizard although if you do get used to the wizard style it is a viable option of stage making I'll just say that much but all right so now we have a little thing to interact with along your way to the shine so file save nice um so let me show you how to get the palm tree data in the level in in the case that your stage doesn't already have palm trees um data stored in it so let's go back to airport one which has we can go go to folder and if you don't remember i did say this one other time a long time ago but inside the map objects folder is object data inside of this regular good old scene folder which we go to uh, you can go to inside of our airport one, which is the stage. You have the scene folder, which is just ignore. You can ignore it pretty much. But within this folder, houses all of the enemies and NPCs, map objects, map objects, map. Uh, this is all the special map data, camera data, custom scripts, pollution parameters, and then inside the second map folder is all the visual stuff. This includes the map itself, um, the sea, and the skybox. That's what this folder contains, uh, and the wave.bti, but yeah. That's what everything contains. Oh, this folder also contains the messages and the table.bin, which we will get into actually pretty soon. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that, just to re-explain everything. Um, but let's go to folder, and uh, let's go to map objects. And so the type of tree we were using right there in our stage was called palm normal. And the way you can figure out what type of object you're using for the most part is if we go to edit scene.bin again, we can go to our palm tree. And then usually it says the model palm normal. So you can take that information, and try and find palm normal in the map objects folder. And we can find palm normal right here. So we can copy all this stuff palm normal wherever it ends palm normal cool and you take all the stuff that's in that that object you hit copy and then you can close out of that and now we go to our level and we go to its folder and we can go in here and hit paste and now we can hit replace and that will replace all the files with the files that it needs to get the tree to work so objects are actually relatively simple once you get it down pat you know you just copy a couple of files, easy, right? Uh, and that is true. It is pretty easy uh, once you get the hang of it. And that is our tree just sitting there. Should work, no problem. But the thing that doesn't work, no problem, uh, as I showed you earlier, is NPCs and enemies. Those are the really complex stuff that I will show you right away right now because I want to get this over with. I got to get to bed. It's like nearly 12, so I do want to hurry this up even though I have a couple things left to show. Um, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and add an enemy into the stage, give it the stage a little bit of actual challenge, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, okay, we'll do strolling stews because strolling stews are really easy to, uh, get to work. So first, we've got to find a map with a strolling stew, which I believe... Actually, the only... Hmm, what place has strolling stews naturally? I know there's a place that does it. I'm just trying to think, but I can't think of it right now. Alright, well, uh, no, nah, I shouldn't do that for the sake of tutorials. Airstrip. Airstrip has it by default. Okay, so let's go over to the uh, endgame airstrip, which should be somewhere around 20. Yes. Perfect. Go to folder, and I'll just show you the level that I'm talking about real quick. We're talking about this level uh, with these guys, the version with these guys. 
These are the Strollin' Stews, or aka Mario Sunshine's Goomba. Um, and we're going to put these in our custom level. Um, but they are rather complex. So let's first take a look at the name. It's Hamu Curry. Um, there's not really like a model that you can see here in the parameters. So just you're going to have to go off of the name here. And right now that is Hamu Curry. So we'll go off of that name. And so we're looking in this folder for, for the Hamu Curry folder. Oh, and there it is, Hamu Curry. So you want to take this folder. Or we're going to hit copy. Okay, we're going to exit it. Now we're going to go back to our stage, which we can minimize these other ones. But we go back to our stage, we go to our folder, and now we just paste it right in. Hamu Curry. Boom. So now the actual enemy's data is in our stage. So we can edit our stages scene.bin, and we can uh, start adding in some Hamu Curries. But there is a, uh, there's a slight catch, and I'll, I'll get to that right away. So just you stay tuned. All right. So now let's open that stage that we got our Hamu Curries from and go to its scene.bin. Okay. Okay. So now we got both open at the same time. And what we want to do is first we scroll up all the way to the top. Because there's this interesting thing that is very, very, very important. Otherwise, it guarantees that your stage will crash. But if you're adding an NPC or an enemy, NPCs and enemies have these things called managers. All right. So what we want to do is we want to look at the, it's always the thing at the top. The top group is always the manager group. Um, so what we want to do is we want to find our Hamu Curry manager, which is the name of this enemy, of course. And we want to take that Hamu Curry manager and we want to copy it. And then we want to just paste it into our stages manager list. So we go ahead and paste. And now we got the Hamu Curry manager. This literally just prevents the game from instantly crashing. It has no, no other purpose, really. Um, so then, next thing you want to copy and paste over is the actual little guy himself. So we're going to take this Hamu Curry guy. We're going to hit copy. And we're going to also note down that this is ID group 7. So we go over here, find ID group 7, and we hit paste. And now we got our Hamu Curry in the stage. Uh, but it is not as simple as this. I'm going to explain the hardest part of making enemies in SMS. And it, it, you get used to it over time, but it's still the most cumbersome part of SMS uh, bin editing. And it's just kind of annoying. Um, but actually, let's put this guy over on the island because it'll be easier to test it on the island because it's a flat surface. Okay, let's get this guy down on the ground. Be better if he's on the ground, you know? Alright, cool. So we got this little stew guy on the ground. So you might notice this little thing over here, um, rail. Rail is the most important thing to getting the stew to actually function like the way you want them to. Um, we're going to have to talk about rail data. So we go to tools, and we can go to uh, rail editor. And this brings up this whole window right here. Okay, So you can see there's a whole bunch of green lines and green boxes that just suddenly showed up. That is the rail data. Um, we can just delete all the rail data right here because none of it is important um, for our use. We just got to create our own new rail data. So we can remove, remove, remove all the rail data. I'm just going to do that so it doesn't clutter up the view. Okay, almost done removing. There we go. So now let's add a new rail data. Um, and I should probably explain this. Um, rails? Rails are essentially the paths that the enemies walk upon. Um, so um, the NPCs or enemies will naturally just go in a circle at position 0, 0, 0 if you don't give them a rail. Um, or at least a lot of them do. And uh, if you don't give them a rail, they'll just s spin in a circle right above the origin point of the stage. Um, and that's not fun. That's 
definitely not fun. So you have to give them an actual path to walk across. Um, so let's add a path for them to walk across. Hit the Add button. And when you hit the Add button, it'll bring this box up. And you can name your rail whatever the heck you want. But we're going to name it Strollin. S-T-R-O-L-L-I-N. We're just going to copy that name real quick and hit OK. So now we got Strollin. And what we want to do is in the rail for this guy, this guy's little object, we want to change the rail to Strollin. So now his rail is Strollin. And that will link him to the rail data that we create for this. So what we want to do is we can hit these little buttons, insert before or insert after, it doesn't matter which one you click, but we're going to add a couple spots for him to walk to. So we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it starts at 0, so I said 5, but it's, it's still 5. So I should probably explain this a little bit. Um, yaw pitch and scale and roll and speed, they do jack squat for most objects in the game. Um, although there's a couple objects that the things actually apply to, and I, I really have no clue how they work sometimes, so I just ignore them completely. Um, the XYZ position is, allows you to put the XYZ position of the different points in the path he walks across. And then the count is the thing that's really important. And so let's go to point zero. So let's put the point zero count to one. So the count tells us how many of these C things we have. Now, what C1 does, uh, C1 tells it what's the next point in this list of points that it's going to. So we want to travel from point zero to point one, right? So we want to put the next thing we're traveling to as one. And what C2 does, it tells us what the thing we were just at before this. So what we, where we were at before zero would be four if we want to make this a circle. So if we're going to make this a circle, where we were at before we were hit one, well, before we hit zero, we were at four. So we hit four. So C1 is the next thing in the list, and C2 is the previous thing in the list, uh, the place that you traveled. C1 is the place that you're traveling to, and C2 is the place that you're traveling from. There we go. That's a good way to explain it. <laughs> um, and that's how you can manually set up paths. Uh, but my boy, Yoshi2, added this little button, Connect Points as Loop, which is a godsend and works like 90% of the time. So what you can do is you can have all these things, but you're too lazy to give it all the freaking things. You can just hit Connect Points as Loop, and you can hit OK. And now that automatically does all this C1 nonsense and C2 nonsense. And so that makes it so that all these numbers go in a nice big circle. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make a nice circle for it. So if I, you can set the position to the camera. So let's go with zero. You can set the position to the camera right here. And you can see that our first little rail node went to right where the camera was a second ago, where I was standing. Now, the thing is, we don't want this to be floating up in the sky. Otherwise, the stew will never reach it. He can't reach the sky because he can't fly. So we want this to be at the same level that the stool, stew is. So we can take the stew's y position, which is actually up and down in sunshine. Y is up and down in sunshine because sunshine is weird like that. Control copy, copy that, and then we can paste that right in, and it rounds it, but well, bam So that brings our little point that we have down back to the ground. So now we can fly around in the camera a little bit and just start placing spots on the map for him to walk to. So the next point we want to walk to We'll put it here. Next point, we'll put it way out here. Uh, set position to camera and paste. And hit that button for the next. Ooh, that's maybe a little too far. Maybe we want to bring it less off the edge because he does veer from his path actually a lot. So Perfect, that's a bit better. All right, so let's go to the next point. And the red line just shows you where he's traveling to. Um, which is nice. All right, we'll set that guy's position to that. And then our final point on the, the loop. Let's just put it like uh, right about here. Oh, no. What's going on here, boys? See, this is what I mean when I said it works like 99% of the time. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really connect it as a loop. Um, cause it's just weird like that. 
Like, what type of loop is this? Uh, let's just connect points this loop again, see if it fixes it. Yeah, there it goes. Um, so that's just how you fix it if it, it doesn't do it right the first time. <laughs> no clue why. It's 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 not a big deal though, because you can just press it again and it fixes it. Um, something interesting to know, and this is really weird, and I figured this out after a couple years of doing the rails and such. And uh, by the way, this auto saves, so you can just exit out of it. And so now this do guy should walk along the path that we programmed him to. Um, but something interesting I figured out is if you assign multiple of these guys, so we can uh, we can uh, copy copy him, and then we can paste him. Now let's say you have two of the same guys, and they're both assigned to, to the same rail. Um, some enemies can both be assigned to the same rail, and the game's fine, but some, some enemies, when both of them are assigned to the same rail, will just crash the game. It's completely stupid and completely arbitrary, and that's why we love SMS, because it's stupid and it's arbitrary. And it was rushed. Uh, but it's still an amazing game. In fact, the best game of all time, in my opinion. Uh, that's not up for debate. Um, but we're just going to delete this guy to keep our variables low. <laughs> We're just going to hit File, Save. And now this should be everything we need to get this little guy moving and working as intended. There are a few other things I do want to show you, though. Uh, and those pertain to red coins and their associated camera data. Um, just a nice little example um, would be Bianco Hills Mission 1. 90% of the shines in the game are these demo shines. And uh, demo shines have camera data with them. And they're a very specific type of camera data where it's like an object. Um, so there's like, let's say this red coin shine up here. Uh, you can see there's this red coin shine. It's for when you get all eight red coins. It's up here. It's on this platform. And you can see that its uh, shine type is demo. And that just means that there's something in the game that once you collect eight red coins, it triggers this shine to like do its little thing and then spawn. All right? Um, so what I'm going to open up now is the tables.bin for it. So you know how we've been editing the scene.bin? This is the tables.bin. Uh, this is responsible for a lot of junk that you just don't got to care about, really. Um, um, there is one thing notable that this thing does, aside from the camera data, and that is it also has the wires, the little ropes. Uh, the ropes are actually in the tables.bin. And if you look cube general info, these are all the wires. The wires are in this cube general info table, which let's if we go down from the list, we can see there are two cube general info tables before the one that the wires are in. So it's always the, it's always going to be the third cube general info table that would be the wires. So you can copy and paste a wire. That's just in the tables.bin rather than the scene.bin for some reason. Uh, anyways, let's get to the camera map info which should have our red coin camera right there. Perfect. All right. So, you know, you would be able to see the the shine in, under normal circumstances, but there's this little object, this little object right here, it's in the tables.bin. Um, it's responsible for the camera that uh, you view the shine sprite spawning at from. So just to show you that I'm not lying to you, this is the camera that uh, the red coin shine spawns from, we're going to put it in somewhere really stupid, like over here. Uh, and we're going to load it in the game, and I'll show you what happens. But um, File, save. Perfect. And we will just I'll just show you what happens. Um, but yeah, if you do want to get a rope, you just copy and paste this, just like anything in the regular scene.bin. And there is actually no files related to it. There's no files you have to copy and paste. There's nothing. You literally just copy the, this little table guy into the other scene. And it just works flawlessly every time. Uh, yeah. And aside from the ropes and the camera, there's literally nothing else you really need to know about this. Um, 
but I will just quick demonstrate that the, the Shine Sprite's cameras are there. And I will also demonstrate what will happen if you don't have the camera data in the stage at all. Because uh, something very interesting does happen. Alright, so I'm grabbing this last 8 red coin in the stage, and you can see the camera data is all the way over there. Even though the Shine is completely up on that platform over there. <laughs> but you didn't see any of it because I moved the camera in a really dumb way where you couldn't see it. Um, so yeah, that's just to prove that it's there. So let me show you what happens when you accidentally, uh, remove the camera data. Alright, so I moved this red coin up here for convenience of showing you what happens when you don't have the camera data. The game still pauses, it still does its little shine thing, but it never really does the shine thing correctly, and so... You can't even collect the shine, which is just great. So if this happens to you, this is because you're missing, 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 <laughs> missing the camera data for the shine, and then it just doesn't get collected. But uh, yeah, that's the way the camera data works. You have to put the little camera box and point it at the shine. It's very simple once you get the hang of it. But yeah, those are just the little oddities with getting shines to work. And this one last thing is having a intro camera data. So I'm just going to go for our custom stage because it doesn't matter even though it's not loading right now. Uh, we can just do this for this stage even though it doesn't load because I can still show you it. Um. So there's, you know how like when you boot up the game there's like a little camera intro? So we can go to camera editor, run demo, and then this will show us the little like intro but it's not doing it at all right now because it's, it's not cool because um, it's a bad program. Anyways camera editor and we can make demo so go to the tools camera editor make demo so every single stage has this little like intro camera showing you what the stage is about um so i'll sh i'm just going to show you how to create that really quick so there's this little tool it's um the intro editor so what you want to do to start off with is file and then hit load and that should just load up uh whatever camera data you had in that level um, but we can, we want to make a new one, so we can just hit file new, but file load is how you restore what you've worked on. Um, so right now we have a timeline with a grand seconds of zero seconds, or zero frames actually, zero frames, this is a cutscene that's zero frames long. So we want to change that, we want to make the cutscene's duration, let's go with 500 frames long, let's go with that, 500 frames. Perfect. All right. So, let's go, so each of these things are like a keyframe, these are called the keyframes, and those are like the points in, t there are specific points in times which tells the camera where to go at what point in time. So let's pick a different point in time, let's go to like 200, let's find 200 somewhere. 200, oh 200, where are you 200? My best friend 200, the number 200. I'm pretty close. Oh, there he is. Okay. So now to add a new keyframe, what you want to do is click the number, then you hit plus, and that will bring up a new menu, and then you hit the number in here again, 200. All right, and once you hit 200 in this little box that shows up, you hit OK, and then that will add a new keyframe at that selected frame. Uh, so let's add one at 499 as well. 499. And we'll add a keyframe there. Perfect. Uh, but those keyframes are like little checkpoints that the camera needs to get to before it gets to the end. Um, so the top one, the red one, is the look at keyframe, aka the red box is telling the camera where it's looking at. Like it'll say, let's say the red box is looking at this stew. So that's where the red box is. Now the blue, the blue box is telling it where to look from. So while I could be over here, and I could be looking at this stew, assuming this little stew is the red box, um, then we are looking at the red box from the blue box, which would be my position right here in space, like over floating over the water. That's the blue box. Uh, hopefully this made sense. So I'm going to start uh, working on this a little bit. Uh, we'll set the camera position to this stew right here. We'll go to the first keyframe, we'll go to look at, and we set the position to the camera position. So this is 
where we are right now, we set the position to our viewer, our little camera. Um, then we can go to this keyframe, set position to camera. All right, perfect. And we can go to the last one and hit set position to camera. Perfect. All right. So now let's go over the blue ones. So now there should be this little red marker if I, if you could see it, but you don't because, uh, because that little stroll and stew is there. Um, anyways, oh, that and I didn't even save it yet. So that makes sense. Um, so let's pick the first position we're looking at it from. So let's start up pretty close, looking at this stew pretty closely. So we'll set the first position here. Now let's set the next position out here. So we'll go to our next keyframe and we'll go here and set the position here and we'll go all the way up here and we'll still be looking at the stew but you don't need to actually look at it in order to set the position but and uh, I believe it's that one that you need to set so there we go. So now we can hit file save tools and now I can go to camera editor instead of run making the demo we can run the demo and that shows us our camera and it's all looking at the stew because that's where our red thing is and you can see the path we just looked at it from this blue line right here uh, and so what you see is we were always the camera was always focused on this guy in the middle um, and our camera moved from here to from here to here and then our camera finally ended right here so we'll just do that again real quick. So camera editor, run demo. We're always looking at the guy in that little red dot. And we move from there all the way out to the corner over here. And then we move finally up to the spot up here. So the thing is, you can make this as complex as you want, add as many points as you want. but And the red, the red points don't actually have to be only the stew guy. Let's say we want to make the, tool, the uh, camera look a little extra fancy, you know? Um, so file load, reopen our camera. So let's say we start off looking at the stew, and then eventually, let's say we want to start looking over at this island. So we bring the camera over here. Uh, we'll just make that position right here. And then by the end of the cutscene, we have it go here for, for good. And set that position, file save file save perfect all right oh whoops i just killed the preview my bad um tools and we go to our camera editor and then run the demo so now you can see the camera points to this red thing and then it goes to the final one and it goes over there and so this is how you make the uh, camera data and the camera data is stored I will show you where it's stored go to folder map camera here and so start camera is the uh, intro camera for the level and uh, certain stages have different like camera datas so let me go to Rico actually I think the Rico that I'm talking about should be all the way at the bottom Rico 8 Uh, if we go to Rico 8, um, like, for example, there's the camera data for Blooper. When Blooper goes and dies, Blooper he goes up into the sky, he goes like, Aah! and then he falls off into the ocean over there. There's camera data for that, because that's not uh, handled by, like, the Shine Sprite thing. That's a camera data in itself, itself. So let's see, camera editor, and then, oh, okay, it doesn't even want to... Uh, load it which is interesting yeah okay so um if i go over to the level in the folder um, go to folder map camera you can see it has b gesso fall camera so these are the camera data that's associated to the camera showing the dead blooper falling into the ocean so there are certain cameras that are assigned to things that aren't just the intro camera but Either way, that's how you make custom camera data for your stages. Um, pretty simple.
Um, that's probably the easiest part of this whole ordeal. It's pretty self-explanatory. That's the whole camera stuff. And with that, I think that is pretty much everything I wanted to cover in my tutorial. Um, if you've made it this far, congratulations. You have now graduated from Mario Hacking High School and you've gotten your diploma. Um, and if you didn't get this far, leave why you didn't get this far in the comments. Uh, tell me what errors you have, all, all that. And I'm sorry if I'm not the type of person who's good for explaining things and doing a tutorial. Um, I honestly never wanted to do this. I knew it would take me absolutely forever. But the thing is, we don't have a tutorial that's, like, solid. So I figured I might as well be the guy, you know? Uh, anyways, thank you for sticking around, and I hope to see a SMS hack made by you real soon, because I am obsessed with SMS, and it is my one love in life, is is this video game. It's a pretty big passion of mine to hack Mario Sunshine. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd be happy to see whatever you guys make, and hey, if it's good enough, maybe we'll put it in Eclipse, but uh, <laughs> just saying. Uh, anyways, I hope this video was helpful. Uh, take care of you guys, and, uh, goodbye.